The Poem of the Man God, Volume One, Chapter Twenty Seven, The Census Edict, Fourth of June, nineteen forty-four. I see the house in Nazareth once again, the little room where Mary usually takes her meals. She is now working at a white piece of cloth. She lays her work down to light a lamp, because it is getting dark. And she can no longer see well in the greenish light which comes in through the door, half open to the orchard. She closes the door too. Her abdomen is now very big, but she is still so beautiful. Her pace is always agile, and all her gestures are gentle. There is none of the heavy, awkward movements which are generally noticed in a woman when she is about to give birth to her child. Only her face has changed. Now she is the. Woman, before, at the time of the Annunciation, she was a young girl with the serene, innocent face of a child. Afterwards, in Elizabeth's house, when the Baptist was born, her face had become more refined and gracefully mature. Now it is the serene but sweetly majestic face of a woman, who has reached her full perfection in maternity. She no longer resembles the Annunciation of Florence, so dear to you, Father. When she was a girl, I saw the resemblance. Her face is now longer and thinner; her eyes are more pensive and larger. In brief, it is like what Mary is now in heaven, because her countenance and age are once again as they were when the Savior was born. Her youth is the eternal youth, which not only has not known the corruption of death. But has not even experienced the withering of age. Time has not touched our Queen and Mother of the Lord, who created time. And if in her torture at the time of Passion, a torture which had begun for her long time previously, I could say since Jesus began to evangelize, she looked old. Such aging was like a veil cast over her incorruptible person. In fact. Since the moment that she sees Jesus risen again, she becomes once again the fresh, perfect creature she was before such torture, as if by kissing his most holy wounds, she had drunk a balm of youth, which cancelled the action of time, and even more so of sorrow. In fact, even eight days ago, when I saw the descent of the Holy Spirit on Whit Sunday, I saw that Mary was beautiful. Most beautiful, and all of a sudden looked younger, as I wrote and had written previously. She looks like a blue angel. Angels do not grow old; they are eternally beautiful, because they reflect the eternal youth and the eternal present of God. The angelical youth of Mary, blue angel, is perfected now, but not in the secrecy of a room unknown to the world, and with only one archangel as witness. It reaches the perfect age, which she took with her to heaven, and which she will keep forever, in her holy, glorified body, when the Spirit adorns her with the bridal ring and crowns her in the presence of everybody. I wanted to make this digression because I thought that it was necessary. I will now revert to the description. Mary thus is now really a woman, full of dignity and grace. Also, her smile has gained a sweetness and majesty. How beautiful she is! Joseph comes in. He seems to be coming from the village because he comes in through the main door, not from the workshop. Mary lifts her head and smiles at him. Also, Joseph smiles, but his smile seems to be a forced one, as if he were worried. Mary looks at him inquisitively. She then gets up to take the mantle that Joseph is taking off, and she folds it. And lays it on a chest. Joseph sits at the table. He rests one elbow on it and lays his head on one hand, while with the other, absent-mindedly, he combs and ruffles his beard with alternate strokes. Is there anything worrying you? asks Mary. Can I help you? You always comfort me, Mary, but this time, I have a big problem. That concerns you, me, Joseph. And what is it? They have posted an edict on the synagogue door. It orders the census of all Palestinians, and everybody must go and register in his place of origin. 
we must go to Bethlehem. Oh, exclaims Mary, interrupting him and putting one hand on her bosom. It's a shock, isn't it? And a sad one, I know. No, Joseph, that's not it. I am thinking. I am thinking of the Holy Scriptures. Rachel, Benjamin's mother, and Jacob's wife, of whom the star will be born. The Saviour. Rachel buried in Bethlehem, of which it is said, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, the least of the clans of Judah, out of you will be born the ruler, the ruler who was promised to the house of David. He will be born there. Do you? Do you think it is already the time? Oh, what shall we do? Joseph is completely dismayed. He looks at Mary with two pitiful eyes. She realises this and smiles. But she smiles more at herself than at him. A smile that seems to say, He is a man, a just man, but a man. And he sees as a man. He thinks as a man. Have pity on him, O soul of mine, and guide him so that he may see as a spirit. But her kindness induces her to reassure him. She is not untruthful. She simply diverts his anxiety. I do not know, Joseph. My time is very close. But could the Lord not delay it to relieve you from this worry? He can do everything. Don't fear. But the journey, think of the crowds. Will we find good lodgings? Will we be in time to come back? And and if, if you are to become a mother there, what will we do? We have no home there. We do not know anybody any longer. Don't be afraid. Everything will be all right. God finds a shelter for the animal about to give birth. Do you think he will not find one for his Messiah? We trust in him, don't we? We always trust in him. The harder the trial, the more we trust. Like two little children, we put our hands in his fatherly ones. He is our guide. We rely entirely on him. Consider how he has led us with love so far. A father, even the best of fathers, could not do it with greater care. We are his children and his servants. We fulfil his will. No harm can befall us. Also this edict is his will. What is Caesar after all? An instrument in the hands of God. Since the time when the father decided to forgive man, he prearranged the events so that his Christ may be born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the smallest town in Judah, did not yet exist and its glory was already destined. And there a powerful man has risen very far from here and he conquered us, and now he wants to know all his subjects. Now while the world is in peace, so that the glory of Bethlehem may be accomplished, and the word of the God may not be belied, as it would be if the Messiah were to be born elsewhere. Oh, what is our small trouble if we consider the beauty of this moment of peace? Just think, Joseph, a period of time when there is no hatred in the world. Can there be a happier hour for the rising of the star, the light of which is divine and its influence is redemption? Oh, do not be afraid, Joseph. If the roads are not safe, if the crowds will make the journey a difficult one, the angels will defend and protect us, not us, but their king. If we find no accommodation, their wings will be our tents. No mishap will befall us. It cannot. God is with us. Joseph looks at her and listens to her, happy. The wrinkles on his forehead smooth away. He gets up, no longer tired or worried. He smiles. You are blessed, son of my soul. You are blessed because you see everything through the grace of which you are full. Don't let us waste time then, because we must leave as soon as possible and come back as soon as possible, because everything is ready here for the... For the, for our son, Joseph, he must be such in the eyes of the world. Remember that the father has covered his coming with the veil of his mystery 
and we must not lift that veil. Jesus will do it when the time comes. The beauty of Mary's face, look, expression and voice when she says this. Jesus cannot be described. It is already an ecstasy and the vision ends on it. Mary says, I will not add much more because my words are already a lesson. But I do wish to draw the attention of wives to one point. Too many marriages break up through the fault of women who do not possess that love which is everything. Kindness, pity and solace to their husbands. The physical suffering that lie heavy on women does not lie heavily on men. But all the moral worries do. Necessities of work, decisions to be taken, responsibilities before the established authorities and one's own family. Oh, how many things weigh on man, and how much comfort he also needs. And yet, a woman's selfishness is such that she adds the weight of useless and sometimes unfair complaints to the burden of her tired, disheartened, worried husband. And all this because she is selfish. She does not love. Love is not the satisfaction of one's senses and utility. To love is to satisfy him whom we love, beyond senses and utility, giving him the help he needs so that he may always be able to keep his wings open in the skies of hope and peace. There is another point to which I wish to draw your attention. I have already spoken of it, but I wish to insist. Trust in God. Trust summarizes the theological virtues. Who trusts has faith. Who trusts hopes. Who trusts loves. When we love, we hope. We believe in a person. We trust. Otherwise, we do not. God deserves our trust. If we trust poor men who may fail, why should we not trust God who can never fail? Trust is also humility. The proud man says, I will do it by myself. I do not trust him because he is an incapable man, a liar, an overbearing fellow. The humble man says, I trust him. Why should I not? Why should I think that I am better than he is? And more rightly, he says of God, why should I mistrust him who is so good? Why should I think that I can do it by myself? God gives himself to the humble, but withdraws from the proud. Trust is also obedience, and God loves the obedient man. Obedience implies that we acknowledge ourselves as his children, and we acknowledge God as our father. And the father can but love when he is a real father, God is our real father and a perfect father. The third point I want you to consider. It is always based on trust. No event can happen unless God allows it. Are you powerful? You became so because God permitted it. Are you a subject? You are such because God permitted it. Endeavor, therefore, powerful one, not to turn your power to your own detriment. It would always be your detriment, even if at the beginning it may appear detrimental to others. Because if God allows, it does not over-allow. And if you go beyond the mark, he will strike you and crush you. Endeavour, therefore, O subject, to make of your condition a magnet that will draw the protection of heaven upon you. And never curse anyone. Leave that to God's care. It is for him the Lord of all, to bless and curse his creatures. Go in peace. The Poem of the Man-God Volume 1, Chapter 28 The Journey to Bethlehem 5th of June, 1944 I see a main road which is very crowded. Little donkeys loaded with goods and chattels or with people are going one way. Other little donkeys are going the opposite way. The people are spurring their mounts and those on foot are walking fast because it is cold. 
The air is clear and dry, the sky serene, but everywhere there is the sharp atmosphere common to winter days. The barren country seems vaster. The short grass in the pastures has been nipped by the winter winds. On the grazing ground, the sheep are looking for some grass, and they are also looking for some sunshine, as the sun is rising very slowly. They are standing very close together, one against the other, because they also are cold, and they bleat, lifting their heads and looking at the sun as if they were saying, Come quick, because it is cold. The ground is undulating, and its undulations are becoming clearer and clearer. It is a real hilly place. There are valleys and slopes covered with grass and ridges. The road runs through the centre and goes southeast. Mary is on a little grey donkey. She is all enveloped in a heavy mantle. In front of the saddle there is the fitting already seen in her journey to Hebron, and on it... There is the little trunk with the basic essential things. Joseph is walking on the side, holding the reins. Are you tired? He asks her now and again. Mary looks at him, smiling, and replies, No, I am not. The third time she adds, You must be tired walking. Oh, me! It's nothing for me. I was only thinking that if I had found another donkey... You would have been more comfortable, and we could have travelled faster. But I just could not find another one. Everybody needs to mount nowadays. But take heart, we shall soon be in Bethlehem. Ephrata is beyond that mountain. They are both silent. The Virgin, when she does not speak, seems to concentrate on internal prayer. She smiles mildly at one of her thoughts, and if she looks at the crowd, she does not seem to see it for what it is. A man, a woman, an old man, a shepherd, a rich or a poor man, but only for what she sees. Are you cold? asks Joseph when the wind starts blowing. No, thank you. But Joseph is not too happy. He touches her feet, which are shot in sandals, and are hanging down along the side of the donkey, and can hardly be seen coming out from under her long dress. And he must feel them cold because he shakes his head and takes a blanket which he has across his shoulders and envelops Mary's leg in it. He spreads it also on her lap, so that her hands may be kept warm, being covered by the blanket and her mantle. They meet a shepherd who cuts across the road with his herd, moving from the grazing ground on the right-hand side of the road to the one of the left-hand side. Joseph bends down to say something to him. The shepherd nods in assent. Joseph takes the donkey and drags it behind the herd into the grazing ground. The shepherd pulls a coarse bowl out of his knapsack. He milks a big sheep with swollen udders and hands the bowls to Joseph, who offers it to Mary. May God bless you both, exclaims Mary. You for your love and you for your kindness, I will pray for you. Are you coming from far? From Nazareth replies Joseph. And where are you going? To Bethlehem. A long journey for a woman in her state. Is she your wife? Yes, she is. Have you got a place where to go? No, we haven't. That's bad. Bethlehem is overcrowded with people who have come from all over to register there and are on their way to register elsewhere. I don't know whether you will find good lodgings. Are you familiar with the place? Not very. Well, I will explain it to you, for her, and he points to Mary. Find a hotel, but it will be full. But I will tell you, just the same, to guide you. It's in the square, in the largest one. The main road will take you to it. You can't miss it. There is a fountain in front of it. It is a long and low building with a very big door. It will be full. But if you do not find room in the hotel or in any of the houses... Go round to the back of the hotel towards the country. There are some stables in the mountain, which are used sometimes by merchants to keep their animals there, on their way to Jerusalem, when they don't find room in the hotel. They are stables, you know, in the mountain. They are damp and cold, and there are no doors, but they are always a shelter, because your wife, she can't have be left on the road. Perhaps you will find room there, and some hay to sleep on for the donkey. 
and may God guide you. And may God give you joy, answers Mary. Joseph instead replies, peace be with you. They take to the road again. A wider valley can be seen from the crest they have climbed over. In the valley, up and down the soft slopes surrounding it, there are many houses. It is Bethlehem. Here we are in David's land, Mary. Now you will be able to rest. You look so tired. No, I was thinking, I think... Mary gets hold of Joseph's hand and says to him with a blissful smile, I think, really, that the time has come. Oh, Lord of mercy, what shall we do? Don't be afraid, Joseph, be steady. See how calm I am. But you must be suffering a lot. Oh, no, I am full of joy, such a joy. So great, so beautiful, so uncontainable, that my heart is thumping and thumping, and it is whispering to me, he's coming, he's coming. It says so at each beat. It is my child knocking at my heart and saying, Mother, I am here, and I am coming to give you the kiss of God. Oh, what a joy, my dear Joseph. But Joseph is not joyful. He is thinking of the urgent need to find a shelter and this quickens his pace. He goes from door to door asking for a room. Nothing. They are all full. They reach the hotel. Even the rustic porches surrounding the large inner yard are full of campers. Joseph leaves Mary on the donkey inside the yard and he goes out looking in other houses. He comes back thoroughly disheartened. He has not found anything. The fast winter twilight is beginning to spread its shadows. Joseph implores the hotel keeper. He implores also some of the travellers. He points out that they are all healthy men, that there is a woman about to give birth to a child. He begs them to have mercy. Nothing. There is a rich Pharisee who looks at them with obvious contempt, and when Mary goes near him, he steps aside as if he had been approached by a leper. Joseph looks at him and his face blushes with disdain. Mary lays her hand on his wrist and calms him and says, Don't insist, let us go. God will provide. They go out and they follow the wall of the hotel. They turn into a little street which runs between the hotel and some poor houses. They then turn behind the hotel. They look for the stables. At last, here are some grottoes, a kind of cellars, I would say rather than stables, because they are so low and damp. The best have already been taken. Joseph is utterly disheartened. Hey, Galilean, an old man shouts. Down there at the end, under those ruins, there is a den. Perhaps there's nobody in it yet. They hurry to the den. It is really a den. Among the ruins of an old building, there is a hole, beyond which there is a grotto. An excavation in the mountain, rather than a grotto. It seems to consist of the foundations of the old building, with the roof formed by rubble supported by coarse tree trunks. There is hardly any light, and to see better, Joseph pulls out a tinder and flint, and he lights a little lamp that he takes out of his knapsack he's carrying across his shoulders. He goes in and is greeted by a bellow. Come in, Mary, it is empty. There is only an ox. Joseph smiles. It's better than nothing. Mary dismounts from her donkey and goes in. Joseph has hung the little lamp on a nail of one of the supporting trunks. They see the vault covered with cobwebs, the soil stamped with ramshackle earth, with holes, rubbish, excrement. The soil is strewn with straw. In the rear, an ox turns its head round and looks with its large, quiet eyes while some hay is hanging from its lips. There is a rough seat and two big stones in a corner near a loophole. The blackness in that corner is a clear sign that a fire is generally lit there. Mary goes near the ox. She's cold. She puts her hand on its neck to feel its warmth. The ox bellows but does not stir. It seems to understand. Also, when Joseph pushes it aside to take a large quantity of hay from the manger, 
and make a bed for Mary. The ox remains calm and quiet. The manger is a double one. That is, there is one out of which the ox eats, and above it there is a kind of a shelf, with some spare hay, which Joseph pulls down. The ox makes room also for the little, little donkey, that tired and hungry as it is, starts eating at once. Joseph discovers also a battered bucket turned upside down. He goes out, because he saw a little stream outside, and he comes back with some water for the little donkey. He then takes possession of a bunch of twigs in the corner, and he tries to sweep the floor with it. He next spreads the hay and makes a bed with it near the ox, in the most sheltered and dry corner. But he realises that the poor hay is damp, and he sighs. He then lights a fire, and with the patience of Job, he dries the hay a handful at a time, holding it near the fire. Mary's sitting on a stool. She's tired. She watches and smiles. The hay is now ready. Mary sits down more comfortably on the soft hay, with her back leaning against one of the tree trunks. Joseph completes the furnishings, hanging his mantle as a curtain on the hole that serves as a door. It is a makeshift protection. He then offers some bread and cheese to the virgin, and he gives her some water out of the flask. Sleep now, he says. I will sit up and watch that the fire does not go out. There is some wood, fortunately. Let us hope that it will burn and last. Thus I will be able to save the oil of the lamp. Mary lies down obediently. Joseph covers her with her own mantle and with the blanket that she had round her feet earlier. But you, you will be cold. No, Mary, I'll be near the fire. Try to rest now. Things will be better tomorrow. Mary closes her eyes without insisting. Joseph creeps into his little corner, sits on the stool with some dry shoot near him. There are very few. I do not think they will last long. They are placed as follows. Mary is on the right-hand side with her back to the door, half hidden by the tree trunk, and the ox, which is laid down on the litter. Joseph is on the left side, towards the door, and since he is facing the fire, his back is turned toward Mary. But he turns round now and again to look at her, and he sees she is lying quietly, as if she were sleeping. He breaks the little sticks as noiselessly as possible, and throws them one at a time onto the little fire, so that it may not go out, and may give some light, and yet make the wood last longer. There is only the dim light of the fire, at times bright, at times very faint. The lamp, in fact, has been put out, and in the half-light only the witnesses of the ox and of Joseph's hands and face can be seen. All the rest is confused mass in the dull, dim light. There is no dictation, says Mary. The vision speaks by itself. It is for you to understand the lesson of charity, humility, and purity emanating from it. Rest, rest watching, as I used to keep watch waiting for Jesus. He will come to bring you his peace. The Poem of the Man God Volume 1, Chapter 29 The Birth of Our Lord Jesus 6th of June, 1944 I still see the inside of the poor stony shelter where Mary and Joseph have found refuge sharing the lot of some animals. The little fire is dozing together with its guardian. Mary lifts her head slowly from her bed and looks round. She sees that Joseph's head is bowed over his chest as if he were meditating and she thinks that his good intention to remain awake has been overcome by tiredness. She smiles lovingly and makes less noise than a butterfly alighting on a rose. She sits up and then goes on her knees. She prays with a blissful smile on her face. She prays with her arms stretched out, almost in the shape of a cross, with the palms of her hands facing up and forward and she never seems to tire in that position. She then prostrates herself with her face on the hay, 
in an even more ardent prayer, a long prayer. Joseph rouses. He notices that the fire is almost out and the stable almost dark. He throws a handful of very slender heath onto the fire and then the flames are revived. He then adds some thicker twigs and finally some sticks because the cold is really biting. The cold of a serene winter night that comes into the ruins from everywhere. Poor Joseph must be frozen sitting as he is near the door, if we can call a door the hole where Joseph's mantle serves as a curtain. He warms his hands near the fire, then takes his sandals off and warms his feet. When the fire is gaily blazing and its light is steady, he turns round, but he does not see anything, not even Mary's white veil that formed a clear line on the dark hay. He gets up and slowly moves towards her pallet. Are you not sleeping, Mary? he asks. He asks the three times until she turns round and replies, I am praying. Is there anything you need? No, Joseph. Try and sleep a little. At least try and rest. I will try, but I don't get tired praying. God be with you, Mary. And with you, Joseph. Mary resumes her position. Joseph, to avoid falling asleep, goes on his knees near the fire and prays. He prays with his hands pressed against his face. He removes them now and again to feed the fire, and then he resumes his ardent prayer. Apart from the noise of the crackling sticks and the noise made now and again by the donkey stamping his hoofs on the ground, no other sound is heard. A thin ray of moonlight creeps in through a crack in the vault, and it seems a blade of unearthly silver looking for Mary. It stretches in length as the moon climbs higher in the sky, and at last reaches her. It is now on her head, where it forms a halo of pure light. Mary lifts her head as if she had a celestial call, and she gets up and goes on to her knees again. Oh, how beautiful it is here now. She raises her head and her face shines in the white moonlight and becomes transfigured by a supernatural smile. What does she see? What does she hear? What does she feel? She is the only one who can tell what she saw, heard and felt in the refulgent hour of her maternity. I can now see that the light around her is increasing more and more. It seems to come down from heaven, to arise from the poor things around her. Above all, it seems to originate from herself. Her deep blue dress now seems of a pale, myosotis blue, and her hands and face are becoming clear blue as if they were placed under the glare of a huge pale sapphire. This hue is spreading more and more on the things around her. It covers them, purifies them, and brightens everything. It reminds me, although it is somewhat softer, of the hue I see in the vision of holy paradise, and also of the colour I saw in the visit of the wise men. The light is given off more and more intensely from Mary's body. It absorbs the moonlight. She seems to be drawing to herself all the light that can descend from heaven. She is now the depository of the light. She is to give this light to the world and this blissful, uncontainable, immeasurable, eternal, divine light which is about to be given is heralded by a dawn, a morning star, a chorus of atoms of light that increase continuously like a tide and rise more and more like incense and descend like a large stream and stretched out like veils. The vault, full of crevices, of cobwebs, of protruding rubble balanced by a miracle of physics. The dark, smoky, repellent vault now seems the ceiling of a royal hall. Each boulder is a block of silver, each crack an opal flash, each cobweb a most precious canopy interwoven with silver and diamonds. A huge green lizard hibernating between two stones seems an emerald jewel forgotten there by a queen. 
and the bunch of hibernating bats is like a precious onyx chandelier. The hay from the upper manger is no longer grass blades, it is pure silver wires quivering in the air with the grace of loose hair. The dark wood of the lower manger is a block of burnished silver. The walls are covered with a brocade in which the white silk disappears under the pearly embroidery of the relief. And the soil, what is the soil now? It is a crystal lit tip by a white light. Its protrusions are like roses thrown in homage of the soil. The holes are precious cups from which perfumes and scents are to arise. And the light increases more and more. It is now unbearable to the eye. And the virgin disappears in so much light as if she had been absorbed by an incandescent curtain. And the mother emerges. Yes, when the light becomes endurable once again to my eyes, I see Mary with the newborn son in her arms. A little baby, rosy and plump, bustling with his little hands, as big as a rosebud, and kicking with his tiny feet that could be contained in the hollow of the heart of a rose, and is crying with a tiny, trembling voice, just like a newborn little lamb, opening his pretty little mouth that resembles a wild strawberry, and showing a tiny tongue that resembles against the rosy roof of his mouth, and he moves his little head that is so blonde that it seems without any hair, a little round head that his mummy holds in the hollow of her hand while she looks at her baby and adores him, weeping and smiling at the same time. She bends down to kiss him, not on his innocent head, but on the centre of his chest, where underneath there is his little heart beating for us, where one day there will be the womb. And his mother is doctoring that wound in advance with her immaculate kiss. The ox, woken up by the dazzling light, gets up with a great noise of hoofs and bellows. The donkey turns his head round and brays. It is the light that rouses them, but I love to think that they wanted to greet their creator, both for themselves and on behalf of all the animals. Also Joseph who almost enraptured, was praying so ardently as to be isolated from what was around him, now rouses and he sees a strange light filter through the fingers of his hands pressed against his face. He removes his hands, lifts his head and turns round. The ox, standing as it is, hides Mary, but she calls him. Joseph, come. Joseph rushes, and when he sees, he stops, struck by reverence. And he is about to fall on his knees where he is. But Mary insists, come, Joseph. And she leans on the hay with her left hand, and holding the child close to her heart with her right one, she gets up and moves toward Joseph, who was walking embarrassed because of a conflict in him between his desire to go and of his fear of being irreverent. They meet at the foot of the straw bed and they look at each other, weeping blissfully. Come, let us offer Jesus to the Father, says Mary. And while Joseph kneels down, she stands up between two trunks supporting the vault. She lifts up her creature in her arms and says, Here I am, on his behalf, O God. I speak these words to you. Here I am to do your will. And I, Mary, and my spouse Joseph with him. Here are your servants, O Lord. May your will always be done by us in every hour in every event, for your glory and your love. Then Mary bends down and says, Here, Joseph, take him, and offers him the child. What? I? Me? Oh no, I am not worthy. Joseph is utterly dumbfounded at the idea of having to touch God. But Mary insists, smiling, 
you are well worthy. No one is more worthy than you are, and that is why the Most High chose you. Take him, Joseph, and hold him while I look for the linens. Joseph, blushing almost purple, stretches his arms out and takes the baby, who is screaming because of the cold, and when he has him in his arms, he no longer persists in the intention of holding him far from himself, out of respect, but he presses him to his heart and bursts into tears, exclaiming, Oh, Lord, my God! And he bends down to kiss his tiny feet and feels them cold. He then sits on the ground and holds them close to his chest. With his brown tunic and his hands, he tries to cover him and warm him, defending him from the bitterly cold wind of the night. He would like to go near the fire, but there is a cold draught there coming from the door. It is better to stay where he is. No, it's better to go between the two animals, which serve as a protection against the air and give out warmth. Thus he goes between the ox and the donkey with his back to the door, bending over the newborn to form his, with his body a shelter, the two signs of which are a grey head with long ears and a huge white muzzle with a steaming nose and two gentle, soft eyes. Mary has opened the trunk and has pulled out the linens and swaddling clothes. She has been near the fire warming them. She now moves towards Joseph and envelops the baby with lukewarm linen and then with her veil to protect his little head. Where shall we put him now? she asks. Joseph looks round, thinking. Wait, he says. Let us move the animals and their hay over the hair. Uh, we will then pull down that hay up there and arrange it in here. The wood on the side will protect him from the air. The hay will serve as a pillow, and the ox will warm him a little with its breath. The ox is better than the donkey. It is more patient and quiet. And he bustles about while Mary is lulling the baby, holding him close to her heart and laying her cheek on his tiny head to warm it. Joseph makes up the fire, without economy this time, to have a good blaze. And he warms the hay as it dries up. He keeps it near his chest so that it will not get cold. Then, when he has gathered enough to make a little mattress for the child, he goes to the manger and sorts it out, as if it were a cradle. It is ready, he says. Now we would need a blanket, because the hay stings, and also to cover him. Take my mantle, says Mary. You will be cold. Oh, it does not matter. The blanket is too coarse. The mantle is soft and warm. I am not cold at all. Don't let him suffer any longer. Joseph takes the white mantle of soft dark blue wool. He double folds it and lays it on the hay, leaving a strip hanging out of the manger. The first bed for the saviour is ready. And the mother, with a sweet graceful gait, moves to the manger, lays him in it and covers him with the strip of her mantle. She arranges it also around his bare head, almost completely covered by the hay, from which it is protected only by Mary's thin veil. Only his little face, the size of a man's fist, is left uncovered. Mary and Joseph, bending over the manger, blissfully happy, watching him sleep his first sleep, because the warmth of the clothes and of the hay has appeased his crying and made him sleepy. Mary says, I promised you that he would come to bring you his peace. Do you remember the peace you enjoyed at Christmas when you saw me with my child? Then it was your time of peace. Now it is your time of pain. But you know by now it is by means of pain that we achieve peace and every grace for ourselves and our neighbours. Jesus man became Jesus God again after the tremendous suffering of his passion. He became peace once more. Peace from heaven, from where he had come and from where he now pours out his peace 
for those who love him in the world. But in the hour of his passion, he, peace of the world, was deprived of that peace. He would not have suffered if he had had it. And he had to suffer, and to suffer excruciatingly to the very end. I, Mary, redeemed woman by means of my divine maternity, but that was only the beginning of woman's redemption. By refusing a human marriage in accordance with my vow of virginity, I had rejected all lustful satisfactions, deserving thus grace from God. But it was not yet sufficient, because Eve's sin was a four-branched tree. Pride, avarice, gluttony, and lust. And all four were to be cut off before making the roots of the tree sterile. By deeply humiliating myself, I defeated pride. I abased myself before everybody. I am not referring to my humility towards God. Such humility is due to the Most High by every creature. Even his word had it. It was necessary for me, a woman, to have it. But have you ever considered what humiliation I had to suffer from men without defending myself in any way? Even Joseph, who was a just man, had accused me in his heart. The others who were not just, had committed a sin of disparagement with regard to my condition, and the rumour of their words had come like a bitter wave to break up against my humanity. And they were the first of the infinite humiliations I was to suffer in my life, as mother of Jesus and of mankind. Humiliations of poverty, of a refugee, Humiliations for reproaches of relatives and friends, who, being unaware of the truth, judged me a weak woman with regard to my behaviour as a mother towards Jesus when he was a young man. Humiliations during the three years of his public life. Cruel humiliations in the hour of Calvary. Humiliation in having to admit that I could not afford to buy a place and the perfumes for the burial of my son. I overcame the avarice of the first parents, renouncing my creature before the time. A mother never renounces a creature unless she is forced to. Whether her heart is asked to renounce a creature by her country, or by the love of a spouse, or even by God himself, she will resent and struggle against the separation. It is natural. A son grows in our womb, and the tie that links him to us can never be completely broken. Even if the umbilical cord is cut, there is a nerve that always remains. It departs from the mother's heart and is grafted into the son's heart. It is a spiritual nerve, more lively and sensitive than a physical one. And the mother feels it stretching even to exceedingly severe pangs if the love of God or of a creature or the need of the country take her son away from her. And it breaks, tearing her heart if death snatches a son from her. And I renounced my son from the very moment I had him. I gave him to God. I gave him to you. I deprived myself of the fruit of my womb to make amends for Eve's thefts of God's fruit. I defeated gluttony, both of knowledge and of enjoyment, by agreeing to know only what God wanted me to know, without asking myself or him more than what I was told. I believed unquestioningly. I overcame the innate personal delight of enjoyment, because I denied myself every sensual pleasure. I confined flesh, the instrument of Satan, together with Satan, under my heel and made of them a step to rise toward heaven. Heaven, my aim where God was. My only hunger, a hunger which is not gluttony, but a necessity blessed by God, who wants us to crave for him. I defeated lust, which is gluttony carried to the extreme of greed. 
because every unrestrained vice leads to a bigger vice, and Eve's gluttony, which was already blameworthy, led to her lust. It was no longer enough for her to enjoy pleasure by herself. She wanted to take her crime to a refined intensity, and thus she became acquainted with lust and was a mistress of lust for her companion. I reversed the terms, and instead of descending, I have always ascended. Instead of causing other people to descend, I have always attracted them towards heaven. Of my honest companion, I made an angel. Now that I possessed God and his infinite wealth with him, I hastened to divest myself of it, saying, Here I am. May your will be done for him and by him. He is chaste, who chastises not only his flesh, but also his affections and his thoughts. I had to be the chaste one in order to annul the one who had been unchaste in her flesh, her heart and her mind. And I never abandoned my reservedness, not even by saying of my son, he's mine, I want him, since he belonged only to me on earth, as he belonged only to God in heaven. And yet, all this was not sufficient to achieve for woman the peace lost by Eve. I obtained that for you at the foot of the cross, when I saw him dying, whom you saw being born. When I felt my bowels being torn apart by the cry of my dying creature, I became void of all femininity. I was no longer flesh but an angel. Mary, the virgin spouse of the Spirit, died that moment. The mother of grace remained, who gave you the grace she generated from her torture. The female reconsecrated a woman by me on Christmas night, achieved at the foot of the cross the means to become a creature of heaven. This I did for you, depriving myself of all satisfactions, even of holy ones. And whereas you had been reduced by Eve to females not superior to the mates of animals, I made of you, if you only wish so, saints of God. I ascended for you, as I had done for Joseph. I lifted you higher up. The rock of Calvary is my mount of olives. From there I took my leap to carry to heaven the re-sanctified soul of woman together with my flesh, now glorified because it had borne the word of God and had destroyed in me the very last trace of Eve. It had destroyed the last root of that tree with four poisonous branches, a root stuck in the sensuality that had dragged mankind to fall and that will go on biting at your intestines until the end of time and to the last woman. From there, where I now shine in the ray of love, I call you and I show you the medicine to control yourselves, the grace of my Lord and the blood of my Son. And you, my voice, Rest your soul in the light of this dawn of Jesus to gain strength for the future crucifixions which will not be spared you because we want you here and one comes here through pain because we want you here and the higher one comes the more one has suffered to obtain grace for the world. Go in peace. I am with you. The Poem of the Man-God Volume 1, Chapter 30, The Adoration of the Shepherds 7th of June, 1944 Eve of Corpus Christi I am writing in the presence of my Jesus Master. He is here for me, all for me. He has come back, after such a long time, all for me. You will say, how? You have been hearing and seeing for almost a month, and you say that he is with you after a long time? I will reply once again, telling you 
what I have already told you several times, both by word of mouth and in writing. There is a difference between seeing and hearing, and above all, there is a difference between seeing and hearing on behalf of other people, and seeing and hearing all for myself, exclusively for myself. In the former case, I am a spectator, and I repeat what I see and hear. But if that gives me joy because they are always things which bring great joy, it is also true that it is, so to say, an external joy. The word is a bad expression of what I feel so clearly. But I cannot find a better one. In brief, just imagine that my joy is like that of one who reads a lovely book or sees a beautiful scene. One is moved, enjoys it, admires its harmony and thinks, how lovely it is to be in the place of this person. Instead, in the latter case, that is, when I hear and see for myself, then I am that person. The word that I hear is for me, the person I see is for me, and it is he and I, Mary and I, John and I. Alive, real, true, close to each other, not in front of me, as if I were watching a film being shown, but beside my bed, or moving about in my room, or leaning on pieces of furniture, or sitting or standing like real people alive, as my guests, which is quite different from a vision on behalf of everybody. In a word, all that is mine. And Jesus is here today. In actual fact, he has been here since yesterday afternoon in his usual white woolen garment, which is rather ivory white and is so different in weight and shade from the magnificent one which he wears in heaven and which seems to be made of immaterial linen and is so white that it seems to be woven with yarn as clear as light. He is here with his long tapering fingers which are white virgin to old ivory, with his handsome long pale face, in which his dominating sweet eyes of dark sapphire shine between his thick brown eyelashes, sparkling with blonde red reflections. He is here with his long, soft hair, which is brighter blonde red, where exposed to light, and darker in the deep folds. He is here. He is here. And he's smiling at me while I write about him, as he used to do at Viareggio, and as he stopped doing as from the Holy Week, causing all the distress which almost became a fever of despair, when in addition to the grief of being deprived of him, I was also bereft of the comfort of living where at least I had seen him, and I could say he used to lean there, to sit down here. Here he bent to lay his hand on my head, and where my relatives had died. Oh, unless one has experienced that, one cannot understand. It is not a question of pretending to have all that. We know very well that they are gratuitous graces, and that we do not deserve them. Neither can we expect them to last when they are granted to us. We know that. And the more they are given to us, the more we lower ourselves in humility, acknowledging our disgusting misery as compared with the infinite beauty and divine wealth which bestows itself upon us. But what do you think, father? Does a son not wish to see his father and mother, or a wife her husband? And when death or a long absence prevents them from seeing their dear ones, do they not suffer? And do they not find comfort by living where they lived? And if they have to leave that place, do they not suffer twice as much, as they lose also the place where their love was reciprocated by the absent relative? Can those who suffer thus be reproached? No, and what about me? Is Jesus not my father and spouse? Dearer, much dearer than the dearest father and spouse. And that he is such to me, you can judge by how I behaved at my mother's death. I suffered, you know. I still weep because I loved her, notwithstanding her character. But you know how I got over that difficult hour? Jesus was there. And he was dearer to me than my mother. 
Shall I tell you something? I suffered and I am suffering more now because of my mother's death, which took place eight months ago, than I suffered then. Because during these last two months I have been without Jesus for me, and without Mary for me, and also now. If they leave me for a moment, I feel more than ever the desolation of being a sick orphan, and I fall again into the deep human grief of those cruel days. I am writing while Jesus is looking at me, and therefore I am not exaggerating or distorting anything. In any case, it is not my custom, and even if it were, it would be impossible to persist in it while he is watching me. I have written this here, where it is not my habit to do so, because with regard to Mary's visions, I never interpose my poor ego, as I already know that I must continue describing her glories. Was her maternity not a crown of glories every moment? I am very ill, and it is burdensome for me to write, and afterwards I feel extremely weak. But in order to make her known, so that she may be loved more, I disregard everything. Are my shoulders aching? Is my heart giving in? Am I suffering from a racking headache? Is my temperature rising? It does not matter. Let Mary be known, beautiful and dear as I see her through God's kindness and hers. And that is enough for me. Later I see a very wide country. The moon is at its zenith, and she is sailing smoothly in a sky crowded with stars. They look like diamond studs fixed to a huge canopy of dark blue velvet, and the moon is smiling in the middle of them with a big white face from which streams of light descend and make the earth white. The barren trees seem taller and dark against so white a ground, whereas the low walls which rise here and there on the boundaries look as white as milk, and the little house far away seems a block of Carrara marble. On my right I see a place enclosed by a thornbush hedge on two sides and by a low rugged wall on the other two. The wall supports a kind of low wide shed which inside the enclosure is built in masonry and part in wood as if in summer the wooden part should be removed and the shed should become a porch. From the enclosure intermittent short bleatings can be heard now and again. It must be the little sheep which dream or perhaps sense that it is almost daybreak because of the very bright moonlight. The brightness is intense to an excessive degree and it is increasing more and more as if the planet were coming near the earth or were sparkling because of a mysterious fire. A shepherd looks out of the door and lifting one arm to his forehead to shield his eyes, he looks up. It seems improbable that one should protect one's eyes from moonlight. But the moonlight in this case is so bright that it blinds people, particularly those who come out from a dark enclosure. Everything is calm. But the bright moonlight is surprising. The shepherd call his companions. They all come to the door. A group of hairy men of various ages. Some are just teenagers. Some are already white-haired. They comment on the strange event and the younger ones are afraid. One in particular, a boy about 12 years old, starts crying and the older shepherds jeer at him. What are you afraid of, you fool? The oldest man says to him. Can't you see that the air is very quiet? Have you never seen clear moonlight? You have always been tied to your mother's apron strings, haven't you? But there are many things for you to see. Once I had gone as far as the Lebanon mountains, even further, high up, I was young and walking as a pleasure, and I was also rich then. One night I saw such a bright light that I thought Elijah was about to come back in his chariot of fire. And an old man, he was the old man then, said to me, A great adventure is about to take place in the world. It was for us a misadventure. Because the Roman soldiers came. Oh, many things you will see if you live long enough. But the little shepherd is no longer listening to him. He looks as if he is no longer frightened. Because he leaves the threshold and steals from behind the shoulders of a brawny herdsman. 
behind whom he had previously sought shelter, and goes out onto the grassy fold in front of the shed. He looks up and walks about like a sleepwalker or one hypnotized by something that compellingly attracts him. At a certain moment, he shouts, Oh! and remains petrified with his arms slightly stretched out. His mates look at one another, dumbfounded. What is the matter with the fool? says one. I will send him back to his mother tomorrow. I don't want mad people as guardians of the sheep, says another. And the old man who had spoken earlier says, Let us go and see before we judge him. Call also the others who are sleeping and bring you sticks. It might be a white animal or some robber. They go in. They call the other shepherds. And they come out with torches and clubs. They join the boy. There, there, he whispers smiling, above the tree. Look at the light that is coming. It seems to be coming on the ray of the moon. There it is. It is coming near. How beautiful it is. I can only see a rather brighter light. So can I. So can I, says the others. No, I see something like a body, says one whom I recognise to be the shepherd who gave the milk to Mary. It is, it is an angel, shouts the boy. Here he is, he's coming down, he's coming near, down. On your knees before the angel of God. A long and venerable, oh, comes from the group of shepherds who fall down face to the ground. And the older they are, the more they appear to be crushed with a refulgent apparition. The young ones are on their knees, looking at the angel who is coming nearer and nearer. And then he stops midair above the enclosure wall waving his large wings, a pearly brightness in the white moonlight surrounding him. Do not fear. I am not bringing you misfortune. I announce you a great joy for the people of Israel and for all the people of the world. The angelic voice is the harmony of a harp and of singing nightingales. Today, in the city of David, the Saviour has been born. In saying so, the angel spreads out its wings wider and wider, moving them as a sign of overwhelming joy. And a stream of golden sparks and precious stones seem to fall from them. A real rainbow, describing a triumphal arch before the poor shed. The Saviour, who is Christ, the angel shines with a brighter light, his two wings, now motionless, pointed upright towards the sky like two still sails on the sapphire of the sea, seem two bright flames ascending to heaven. Christ the Lord! The angel gathers his sparkling wings and covers himself with them as if they were a coat of diamonds on a dress of pearls. He bows down in adoration, with his arms crossed over his heart, while his head bent down as it is, disappears in the shade of the tops of the folded wings. Only an oblong, bright, motionless form can be seen for a few moments. But now he stirs. He spreads out his wings, lifts his head, bright with a heavenly smile, and says, You will recognise him from the following signs. In a poor stable behind Bethlehem, you will find a baby in swaddling clothes in a manger for animals, because no roof was found for the Messiah in the city of David. The angel becomes grave, almost sad, in saying that. But from the heavens, many angels, oh, how many, come down, all like him, a ladder of angels descending and rejoicing and dimming the moonlight with their heavenly brightness. They all gather round the announcing angel, fluttering their wings, exhaling perfumes, playing notes in which the most beautiful voices of creation find a recollection, but elevated to uniform perfection. If painting is the expression of matter to become light, here melody is the expression of music to give men a hint of the beauty of God. To hear this melody is to know paradise, where everything is harmony of love, 
which emanates from God, to make the blessed souls happy, and then from them returns to God to say to him, We love you. The angelical glory spreads throughout the quiet country in wider and wider circles, and the bright light with it, and the birds join their singing to greet the early light, and the sheep add their bleatings for the early sun. But as previously in the grotto for the ox and the donkey, I love to believe that the animals are greeting their creator, who has come down among them to love them both as a man and as God. The singing slowly fades away, as well as the light, and the angels ascend to heaven. The shepherds come back to reality. Did you hear? Shall we go and see? And what about the animals? Oh, nothing will happen to them. We're going to obey God's word. But where shall we go? Didn't he say that he was born today? and that they did not find lodgings in Bethlehem. It is the shepherd who gave the milk, who is speaking now. Come with me. I know where he is. I saw the woman, and I felt sorry for her. I told them where to go, for her sake, because I thought they might not find lodgings, and I gave the man some milk for her. She's so young and beautiful, and she must be as good and kind as the angel who spoke to us. Come, let's go and get some milk, cheese, Lambs and tanned hides, they must be very poor, and I wonder how cold he must be whose name I dare not mention. And imagine, I spoke to the mother as I would have spoken to a poor wife. They go into the shed and they come out shortly afterwards, some with little flasks of milk, some with little nets interwoven with esparto containing small, whole, round cheeses, some with baskets, each containing a little bleating lamb, and some with tanned hides. I am taking them a sheep. She lambed a month ago. Her milk is very good. It will be useful if the woman should have no milk. She seems a young girl to me, and so pale, a jasmine face in the moonlight, says the shepherd who gave the milk, and he leads them. They set out in the moonlight, aided by the torches, after closing the shed and the enclosure. They go along country paths, among thorn bushes, hedges stripped by winter. They go round Bethlehem. They reach the stable not the way Mary came, but from the opposite direction, so that they do not pass in front of better stables. Instead, they find this one first. They go near the hole. Go in. I wouldn't dare. You go in. No. At least have a look. You, Levi. Who saw the angel first? Obviously, because you are better than we are. Look in. Before they said he was mad. But now it suits them, if he dare, what they do not. The boy hesitates, but then he makes up his mind. He goes near the hole, pulls the mantle a little to one side, looks, and remains enraptured. What can you see? They ask him anxiously in low voices. I can see a beautiful young woman and the man bending over a manger, and I can hear, I can hear a little baby crying, and the woman is speaking to him in a voice. Oh, what a voice! What is she saying? She's saying, Jesus, little one, Jesus, love of your mummy, don't cry, little son, She's saying, oh, if I could only say to you, take some milk, little one, but I have not got yet any. She says, you are so cold, my love, and the hay is stinging you. How painful it is for your mummy to hear you crying so, without being able to help you. She says, sleep, soul of mine, because it breaks my heart to hear you crying and see your tears. And she kisses him. And she must be warming his little feet with her hands, because she's bent with her arms in the manger. Call her. Let them hear you. I won't. You shall call her, because you brought us here, and you know her. The shepherd opens his mouth, but he only utters a faint moaning noise. Joseph turns round and comes to the door. 
Who are you? Shepherds, we brought you some food and some wool. We have come to worship the Saviour. Come in. They go in, and the stable becomes brighter because of the light of the torches. The older men push the young ones in front of them. Mary turns round and smiles. Come, she says, come. And she invites them with her hand and a smile. And she takes the boy who saw the angel and she draws him to herself against the manger. And the boy looks and is happy. The others, invited also by Joseph, move forward with their gifts. And they place them at Mary's feet with a few deep felt words. They then look at the baby, who is weeping a little, and they smile, moved and happy. And one of them, somewhat bolder than the rest, says, Mother, take this wool. It is soft and clean. I prepared it for my child who is about to be born, but I offer it to you. Lay your son in this wool. It will be soft and warm. And he offers the sheep hide, a beautiful hide, well covered with white, soft wool. Mary lifts Jesus and puts it round him. And she shows him to the shepherds, who, kneeling on the hay on the ground, look at him ecstatically. They become bolder, and one suggests he should be given a mouthful of milk, better still, some water and honey. But we have no honey. We give it to little babies. I have seven children, and I know. There is some milk here. Take it, woman. But it is cold. It should be warm. Where is Elias? He has the sheep. Elias must be the shepherd who gave the milk. But he is not there. He remained outside and is looking from the hole. But he cannot be seen in the dark night. Who led you here? An angel told us to come, and Elias showed us the way. But where is he now? The sheep declares his presence with a bleat. Come in. You are wanted, he enters with his sheep, embarrassed, because they all look at him. It's you, says Joseph, who recognises him, and Mary smiles at him, saying, You are good. They milk the sheep, and with the hem of a piece of linen dipped into the warm, creamy milk, Mary moistens the lips of the baby who sucks the sweet cream. They all smile, and even more so when Jesus falls asleep in the warmth of the wool with a little bit of linen still between his lips. But you can't stay here. It is cold and damp, and there is too strong a smell of animals. It's not good. It's not good for the saviour. I know, replies Mary with a deep sigh, but there is no room for us in Bethlehem. Take heart, woman. We will look for a house for you. I will tell my mistress, says Elias. She's good. She will receive you even if she had to give you her own room. As soon as it is daylight, I will tell her. Her house is full of people, but she will find a room for you. For my child, at least, Joseph and I can lie also on the floor, but for the little one. Don't worry, woman. I will see to it. And we will tell many people what we were told. You will lack nothing. For the time being, take what our poverty can give you. We are shepherds. We are poor too, and we cannot reward you, says Joseph. Oh, we don't want it. Even if you could afford it, we would not want it. The Lord has already rewarded us. He promised peace to everybody. The angel said, peace to men of good will. But he has already given it to us, because the angel said that this child is the Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. We are poor and ignorant. But we know that the prophets say that the Saviour will be the Prince of Peace, and he told us to come and adore him. That is why he gave us his peace. Glory be to God in the Most High Heaven, and glory to his Christ here, and you are blessed the woman who gave birth to him. You are holy, because you deserved to bear him. Give us orders as our Queen, because we will be happy to serve you. What can we do for you? You can love my son and always cherish the same thoughts as you have now. But what about you? Is there anything you wish? Have you no relatives whom you would like to inform that he has been born? Yes, I have them, 
but they are far away. They are to Hebron. I will go, says Elias. Who are they? Zacharias the priest and my cousin Elizabeth. Zacharias? Oh, I know him well. In summer, I go up those mountains because the pastures are rich and beautiful, and I am a friend of his shepherd. When I know you are settled, I will go to Zacharias. Thank you, Elias. You need not thank me. It is a great honor for me, a poor shepherd, to go and speak to the priest and say to him, The Savior has been born. No, you must say to him, Your cousin, Mary of Nazareth, has said that Jesus has been born and that you should come to Bethlehem. I will say that. May God reward you. I will remember you, Elias, and every one of you. Will you tell your baby about us? I certainly will. I am Elias, and I am Levi, and I am Samuel, and I am Jonah, and I am Isaac, and I am Tobias, and I am Jonathan, and I am Daniel, and I am Simeon. My name is John. I am Joseph, and my brother Benjamin, we are twins. I will remember your names. We must go, but we will come back. And we will bring others to worship him. How can we go back to the sheepfold, leaving the child? Glory be to God who has shown him to us. Will you let us kiss his dress? Asks Levi with an angelic smile. And Mary lifts Jesus slowly, and sitting on the hay, envelops the tiny little feet in a linen and offers them to be kissed. And the shepherds bow down to the ground and kiss the tiny feet, veiled by the linen. Those with a beard clean it first. Almost everyone is crying. And when they have to go, they walk out backwards, leaving their hearts there. The vision ends thus, with Mary sitting on the straw with the child on her lap, and Joseph, who leaning with his elbow on the manger, looks and adores. Jesus says, I will speak today. You are very tired, but have a little more patience. It is the eve of Corpus Christi. I could speak to you about the Eucharist and the saint who became apostles of its cult. And I spoke to you of the saints who are apostles of the Sacred Heart. But I want to speak to you of something else and of a class of worshippers of my body who are the forerunners of its cult that is, the shepherds. They were the first worshippers of my body of the world, who had become man. Once I told you, and also my church says this, the holy innocents are the protomartyrs of Christ. Now I tell you that the shepherds are the first worshippers of the body of Christ. And they have all the qualifications to be the worshippers of my body. O Eucharistic souls, firm faith. They believe the angel promptly and unquestioningly. Generosity. They give all their wealth to their Lord. Humility. They approach people who, from the human point of view, are poorer than they, and they do so with a modest attitude that does not humiliate them and they profess themselves their servants. Desire. What they are unable to offer, they endeavor to obtain by means of charitable work. Prompt obedience. Mary wishes to inform Zacharias and Elias goes at once. It does not postpone the matter. Love, finally. They suffer in departing from the grotto, and you say, they leave their hearts there, and you are right. But should not the same happen with my sacrament? And there is another point, and it is entirely for you. Note to whom the angel reveals himself first, and who deserves to hear Mary's love effusions. Levi, the boy. God shows himself to those who have a child's soul, and he shows them also his mysteries and allows them to hear his divine words and Mary's. And those with a child's soul have also Levi's holy daring and they say, 
let us kiss Jesus' dress. They say that to Mary, because it is always Mary who gives you Jesus. She is the bearer of the Eucharist. She is the living pyx, who goes to Mary, finds me, who asks her for me, receives me from her. When a creature says to Mary, give me your Jesus that I may love him, my mother's smile causes heaven's color to change into a more lively brightness because of its greater delight. Say therefore to her, let me kiss Jesus' dress, let me kiss his wounds, and there even more, let me rest my head on your Jesus' heart, that I may delight in it. Come and rest, like Jesus in his cradle, between Jesus and Mary. The Poem of the Man-God, Volume 1, Chapter 31, Zacharias's Visit, 8th of June, 1944. I see the big room where I have already seen the meeting of the Magi with Jesus and their adoration. I understand that I am in the hospitable house where the Holy Family has been received. And I see Zacharias' arrival. Elizabeth is not there. The landlady runs out into the lobby to meet the arriving guest, and she shows him to a door. She knocks and then withdraws discreetly. Joseph opens the door, and he utters a cry of joy when he sees Zacharias. He takes him into a little room as small as a corridor. Mary suckling the child. She will not be long. Sit down, you must be tired. And he makes room for his guest on his couch and sits beside him. I hear Joseph asking after little John, and Zacharias replies, He is growing as strong as a little colt, but he is teething now, and he is suffering a little. That is why we did not want to bring him. It is very cold, and that is why Elizabeth did not come either. She could not leave him without milk. She was very upset, but the season is so rigorous. It is rigorous indeed, replies Joseph. The man you sent me told me that you were homeless when he was born. You must have suffered a lot. Yes, quite a lot, but our fears were greater than our discomfort. We were afraid the child's health might be injured, and we had to stay there for the first days. We lacked nothing for ourselves, because the shepherds gave the good news to the people of Bethlehem, and many of them brought us gifts. But we had no house, not even a decent room, a bed, and Jesus cried so much, particularly at night, because the wind was blowing in from all directions. I used to light a little fire, only a little one, because the smoke made Jesus cough, and it was still cold in any case. Two animals do not give out much heat, especially when the cold air comes in from all directions. We had no warm water to wash him, nor dry clothes to change him. Yes, he suffered quite a lot. And Mary suffered seeing him suffer. I suffered. So you can imagine his mother's anguish. She fed him with milk and tears, milk and love. Now here it is much better. I had made for him such a comfortable cradle. And Mary had fitted it with a soft little mattress. But it is in Nazareth. Ah, oh, if he were born there, it would have been different. But Christ was to be born in Bethlehem. It was prophesied. Mary comes in. She heard their voices. She is all dressed in white wool. She has taken off the dark dress she was wearing during the journey and in the grotto. And she is all white, as I have seen her dressed before. She is not wearing anything on her head, and she is holding Jesus in her arms. He is sleeping, sated with milk in his pure white swaddling clothes. Zacharias stands up reverently and bows down in veneration. He then goes nearer and looks at Jesus with the greatest respect. He bends down, not so much to see him better as to pay him homage. Mary offers the child to him and Zacharias takes him with such adoration that he seems to be holding up a monstrance. It is in fact the host that he takes in his hands, the host already offered, 
that will be sacrificed after being given to men as a nourishment of love and redemption. Zacharias hands Jesus back to Mary. They all sit down and Zacharias explains once again to Mary the reason why Elizabeth had not come and how upset she was. During the past month she has prepared some linens for your blessed son. I have brought them to you. They are downstairs in the wagon. He rises and goes out, then comes back with a large parcel and a smaller one. Joseph relieves him from the heavier one, and Zacharias starts pulling his gifts from both of them. A soft, hand-woven woolen blanket, some linens, and little dresses. Then from the other one, some honey, some snow-white flour, butter, apples for Mary, and cakes baked by Elizabeth, and many more little things, which are a token of the motherly love of the grateful cousin for the young mother. Please tell Elizabeth that I am very grateful to her, as I am grateful to you too. I would have been so happy to see her, but I understand the situation, and I would also have loved to see little John. But you will see him in spring. We will come and see you. Nazareth is too far away, remarks Joseph. Nazareth? But you must stay here. The Messiah must grow up in Bethlehem. It is David's town. The Most High, through Caesar's will, brought him to the town of David's land, the holy land of Judea. Why take him to Nazareth? You know in what opinion the Jews hold the Nazarenes. This child is to be, in future years, the saviour of his people. The capital town must not scorn its king because he comes from a despised land. You know as well as I do how captious the Sanhedrin is and how disdainful its three main castes are. And then here near me, I will be able to help you somehow and put everything I have, not so much in the way of material things, but of moral gifts, at the service of this newborn baby. And when he is old enough to understand, I will be very happy to be his teacher, and I will be for my own son, so that later when he grows up, he will bless me. We must consider that he is destined for great things, and consequently he must be in a position to present himself to the world with all the necessary means to win his game. He will certainly possess wisdom, but also the simple fact that he was educated by a priest will make him more agreeable to the difficult Pharisees and scribes, and will render his mission easier. Mary looks at Joseph, and Joseph looks at Mary. Above the rosy, innocent head of the child, sleeping unaware of it all, there is a silent exchange of questions, and they are questions full of sadness. Mary is thinking of her little house. Joseph is concerned about his work. Here, where only a few days ago they were completely unknown, they must start from scratch. Here they have none of the dear things they left at home, and which they had prepared with so much love for the child. And Mary said so. How can we do that? We have left everything there. Joseph had worked so hard for my Jesus, without sparing labour or money. He worked at night so that during the day he could work for other people and thus earn enough to buy the best wood, the softest wool, the finest linen, and prepare everything for Jesus. He built beehives, and he even worked as a mason to build certain modifications in the house, so that the cradle could be placed in my room and remain there until Jesus had grown up, and the cradle could then be replaced by a bed, because Jesus will stay with me until he is an adolescent. Joseph can go and get what he left there. And where will we put it? You know, Zacharias, that we are poor. We have only our work and our home. And they both enable us to live without starving. But here, perhaps we will find some work, but we will always have the problem of a house. This good woman cannot give us hospitality forever, and I cannot sacrifice Joseph more than he has already sacrificed himself for my sake. Oh, me? It's nothing for me. I am concerned with Mary's grief, her grief in not living in her own house. Two big tears well from Mary's eyes. I think 
that house must be as dear to her as paradise, because of the mystery which was accomplished in it. I speak little, but I understand a lot. If it wasn't for that, I would not be upset. I will work twice as much, that's all. I am young and strong enough to work twice as much as I used to, and see to everything. And if Mary does not suffer too much, and if you say that we must do so, well, here I am. I will do whatever you think is best, provided that it will help Jesus. It will certainly help. Think it over, and you will see the reasons. It is also said that the Messiah will be called Nazarene, objects Mary. True, but at least, until he is grown up, let him grow up in Judea. The prophet says, And you, Bethlehem Ephrata, will be the greatest, because out of you will come the Saviour. He does not speak of Nazareth. Perhaps that title was given to him for some reason unknown to us. But this is his land. You say so, you priest, and we, we listen to you with sad hearts, and we believe you. But how painful it is. When shall I see that house where I became a mother? Mary is weeping silently, and I understand her grief. Oh, I do understand. The vision ends on Mary's weeping. Mary then says, I know that you understand, but you will see me crying more bitterly. For the time being, I want to relieve your spirit by showing you Joseph's holiness. He was a man. That is, he had no other help for his spirit except his holiness. I had all the gifts of God in my condition of immaculate. I did not know I was such, but the gifts were active in my soul and gave me spiritual strength. But he was not immaculate. Humanity was in him with all his heavy weight, and he had to rise toward perfection with all that burden at the cost of continuous efforts of all his faculties to reach perfection and be agreeable to God. Oh, my holy spouse, holy in everything, also in the most humble things in life, holy for his angelical chastity, holy for his human honesty, holy for his patience, his activity, for his constant serenity, for his modesty, for everything. His holiness shines also in this event. A priest says to him, You ought to settle here. And he replies, fully aware of the greater hardships he would have to face. It is nothing for me. I am concerned with Mary's grief. If it was not for that, I would not be upset, provided that it will help Jesus. Jesus, Mary, his angelical love, my holy spouse loved nothing else on earth, and he sacrificed himself to that love. They elected him protector of Christian families, of workers, and many other categories, but he should be appointed protector not only of dying people, of married couples, of workmen, but also of those consecrated to God, who, of all the people in the world consecrated to the service of God, has consecrated himself, as he did, to the service of his God. Accepting everything, foregoing everything, bearing everything, fulfilling everything with quickness, with a cheerful mind, a constant humour. There is no one like him. And I wish to draw your attention to another point, nay, two points. Zacharias is a priest. Joseph is not, but you must note how he, who is not a priest, has a more heavenly soul than the priest. Zacharias thinks in a human way, and in a human way he expounds the scriptures because he allows himself to be led by his good human sense, and it is not the first time he does so. And he was punished for it, but he relapses, although less gravely. With regard to John's birth, he said, how can that happen if I am old and my wife is barren? Now, he says, to smooth his way, Christ is to be brought up here. And with that subtle root of pride that persists also in the best people, 
he thinks that he can be useful to Jesus. Not useful in the sense that Joseph wanted to be by serving him, but by teaching him. God forgave him because of his good intention. But did the master need teachers? I endeavoured to make him see the truth of the prophecies, but he felt he was more learned than I was and made use of such feeling in his own way. I could have insisted and outdone him, but this is the other point I wanted to draw your attention to. I respected the priest because of his dignity, not because of his knowledge. In general, a priest is always enlightened by God. I said, in general. He is enlightened when he is a real priest. It is not his robe that consecrates him, it is his soul. To judge whether one is a real priest, one must consider what comes out of his soul. As my Jesus said, the things that sanctify or contaminate come out from the soul, and they characterize the whole behavior of a person. So when one is a real priest, he is generally inspired by God. We must have a supernatural charity and pray for the others who are not such. But my son has already placed you at the service of his redemption, so I will say no more. Be happy to suffer, so that the number of real priests may increase, and rely peacefully on the word of him who guides you, and believe and obey his advice. Obedience always saves you, even if the advice given to you is not completely perfect. As you know, we obeyed, and we did well. It is true that Herod confined the slaughter of the children to Bethlehem and its surroundings. But could Satan not have spread and propagated such hatred much further and wider, and have induced all the mighty ones in Palestine to commit a similar crime in order to kill the future king of the Jews? He could have done that, and it would have happened in Christ's early days, when the repeated miracles had drawn the attention of both the crowds and of those in power. If such an event had taken place, how could we have crossed the whole of Palestine to go from Nazareth to Egypt, the hospitable land of the persecuted Jews, and make such a journey with a little child, and while persecution was raging? It was easier to flee from Bethlehem, even if the flight was equally painful. Obedience always saves you, remember that. And respect for a priest is always a sign of a Christian education. Woe to those priests who lose their apostolic ardour. Also Jesus said that. But woe also to those who think that they are right in despising them, because they consecrate and hand out the true bread that descends from heaven. And that contact makes them holy just like a sacred chalice, even if they are not totally holy. They will answer to God for it. You must consider them as such and not worry about anything else. You must not be more strict than your Lord Jesus, who, at their command, leaves heaven and descends to be raised by their hands. You must learn from him. And if they are blind, if they are deaf, if their souls are paralysed and their thoughts are unsound, if they are lepers full of faults in strong contrast with their mission, if they are like corpses in sepulchres, then call Jesus that he may heal them and revive them. Call him with your prayers and your sufferings, O victim souls. To save a soul is to predestine one's own soul to heaven. But to save the soul of a priest is to save a large number of souls, because every holy priest is a net that drags souls to God. And to save a priest, that is to sanctify, re-sanctify, is to create this mystical net. Each prey is a light to be added to your eternal crown. Go in peace. The Poem of the Man-God, Volume 1, Chapter 32, Presentation of Jesus in the Temple, 1st of February, 1944. I see a couple of people departing from a very modest house, a very young mother 
comes down an outside staircase holding in her arms a child enveloped in a white cloth. I recognised our mother. She is always the same, pale and blonde, agile and so kind in her behaviour. She is dressed in white, with a pale blue mantle and a white veil on her head. She is carrying her child so carefully. Joseph is waiting for her at the foot of the steps with a little grey donkey. Joseph is dressed entirely in light brown, both his tunic and his mantle being the same colour. He looks at Mary and smiles at her. When Mary arrives near the little donkey, Joseph places the animal's bridle on his left arm. He takes for a moment the child, who is sleeping peacefully, and thus allows Mary to sit more comfortably on the donkey's saddle. He then hands Jesus back to her, and they set out. Joseph is walking beside Mary, holding the bridle all the time and ensuring that the donkey goes straight on without stumbling. Mary is holding Jesus in her lap, and lest he might feel cold, she spreads the edge of her mantle over him. Joseph and Mary speak very little, but they often smile at each other. The road, which is not a model road, winds along a country made barren by the season of the year. Only a few other travellers meet them on the road or overtake them. Then I see some houses and the walls around the town. They go in through a gate and start walking on the pavement which is all broken up and very irregular. Progress is now much more difficult, both because the traffic causes the donkey to stop every moment and because the holes where stones are missing make the poor animal jerk continuously and thus Mary and the child are also disturbed. The road is not flat, it is uphill, although, but slightly, it is a narrow road running between high houses with small narrow low doors and only a few windows on the road. High above, the sky can be seen peeping with many thin blue strips between the houses, nay, between the terraces. Down in the street, there are many people and much shouting. They meet other people on foot or riding donkeys or leading loaded donkeys and a crowd following a cumbersome camel caravan. At a certain moment, a patrol of Roman legionaries passes by with a great noise of hooves and arms and they disappear beyond an arch built across a narrow, stony road. Joseph turns left along a wider and more pleasant road. I can see the embattled town walls, with which I am already familiar, at the end of the street. Mary dismounts from the little donkey near a gate, where there is a kind of stall for other donkeys. I say stall because it is kind of shed, or better still, a kind of shed spread with straw. There are also some poles with rings to which the animals are tied. Joseph gifts some coins to a little man who has gone up to him, and with them he buys some hay, and he draws a pail of water from the rustic well in the corner. He then feeds the donkey. He joins Mary, and they both enter the enclosure of the temple. At first, they turn their steps towards an arcade, where the merchants are, to whom Jesus later will give a good lashing, the vendors of lambs and doves and the money changers. Joseph buys two little white pigeons. He does not change any money. He obviously has what is required. They then make for a side door with eight steps, as all the doors seem to have, because the centre of the temple is raised above the surrounding ground. The door opens into a great hall, like the doors of our houses and towns, to give you an idea. Only this one is larger and more ornate. In the hall, there are, on the right and on the left, two kinds of altars. That is, two rectangular constructions, the purpose of which I do not understand at first. They are like low basins, because the internal part is lower than the external rim, which is a few centimetres higher. A priest approaches them. I do not know whether he was called by Joseph or whether he did so of his own accord. Mary offers her two little pigeons, and since I know their fate, I turn my eyes elsewhere. I watch the decorations of the very heavy portal, of the ceiling and of the hall, 
but I get the impression by a side glance that the priest sprays Mary with some water. It must be water, because I do not see any stains on her dress. Then Mary, who had given the priest a handful of coins together with the two pigeons, I had forgotten to mention that, goes into the real temple in the company of the priest. I am watching everything. It is a most ornate place. Sculptured angels' heads, palms and decorations adorn the columns, the walls and the ceiling. Light comes in through strange, long, narrow windows, obviously without panes built diagonally with regard to the walls. I suppose the idea is to keep the rain out. Mary moves forward to a certain point. She then stops. A few metres from her, there are more steps on top of which there is a kind of water, beyond which there is another construction. I now realise that I thought I was in the temple. Instead, I was in the part surrounding the real temple, that is, the holy beyond which no one can proceed, apparently, except the priests. What I therefore thought was the temple is but an enclosed vestibule, which on three sides encircle the temple in which the tabernacle is enclosed. I do not know whether I have made myself understood, but I am neither an architect nor an engineer. Mary offers the child, who has woken up and is turning his innocent eyes towards the priest, with the astonished look of infants a few days old. The priest takes him in his arms and raises him, with arms fully stretched out, towards the temple, standing against the kind of altar placed on top of the steps. The rite is over. The child is handed back to his mother, and the priest goes away. There is a group of onlookers, amongst them a little old man, bent with age and limping, makes his way leaning on a stick. He must be very old, I would say over eighty. He goes near Mary and asks her to give him the child for one moment. Mary satisfies him, smiling. Simeon, whom I always thought belonged to the sacerdotal class, is instead a simple believer, at least according to his garments, takes the child and kisses him. Jesus smiles at him with the typical smile of sucklings. He seems to watch him inquisitively, because the old man is crying and laughing at the same time, and his tears form a sparkling embroidery running along his wrinkles and beading his long white beard, towards which Jesus stretches his little hands. He is Jesus, but still a child, and whatever moves in front of him draws his attention, so that he wants to get hold of it to see what it is. Mary and Joseph smile, and so do all the others who praise the beauty of the child. I hear the words of the holy old man, and I see the astonished gaze of Joseph, the deeply moved look of Mary, as well as the glances of the little crowd, partly surprised and moved, partly laughing at the words of the old man. Amongst the latter, there are some bearded and conceited members of the Sanhedrin, who shake their heads, giving Simeon an ironic pitying look. They must think he is a dotard. Mary's smile fades into paleness when Simeon mentions sorrow. Although she knows, that word pierces her soul. She goes closer to Joseph to be comforted. She presses her child to her breast passionately and like a thirsty soul. She takes in the words of Anna of Panuel, who, being a woman, has mercy on her suffering and promises her that the Eternal Father would soothe the hour of sorrow with a supernatural strength. Woman, he who gave a saviour to his people, will not lack the power to send his angel to console your tears. The great women of Israel never lacked the help of the Lord, and you are far greater than Judith and Jael. Our God will give you a heart of the most pure gold to withstand the storm of sorrow so that you will be the greatest woman in creation, the mother, and you, child, remember me in the hour of your mission. And the vision ends here. 2nd of February, 1944. Jesus says, Two teachings 
applicable to everybody, derived from the description given by you. The former. Truth is not revealed to a priest engrossed in rites, but absent with his spirit. It is instead revealed to a simple believer. The priest, always in contact with divinity, devoted to what concerns God and to everything which is above the flesh, should have realized at once who was the child who was being offered that morning in the temple. But it was necessary for him to have a living spirit in order to realize it, a mere robe covering a drowsy spirit, if not a dead spirit, was not sufficient. The spirit of God can thunder if it wants, and rouse like a thunderbolt, and shake like an earthquake the dullest spirit it can. But generally, as it is an orderly spirit, as God is order in each person and way of acting, it inspires and speaks, not where there is sufficient merit to deserve its effusion, in which case its effusions would be most rare, and not even you would know their light, but where it sees the good will to deserve such fusion. How is such will exerted? With a life devoted as far as possible entirely to God, in faith, obedience, purity, charity, generosity, and in prayer. Not in practices, in prayer. There is less difference between night and day than there is between practices and prayer. The latter is communion of the Spirit with God, from which you emerge with fresh strength and a decision to belong more and more to God. The former, a common habit exerted for various purposes, which are always selfish, and they leave you exactly as you were. Nay, they aggravate your burden with the faults of falsehood and sluggishness. Simeon had such good will. He had not been spared troubles and trials in his life, but he had not lost his good will. Age and misfortunes had not impaired or shaken his faith in the Lord and in his promises. Neither did his good will to be more and more worthy of God tire or falter. And God sent him the ray of the Spirit to guide him to the temple that he might see the light that had come to the world, before his eyes of a faithful servant closed to the light of the sun, awaiting to be reopened to the Son of God glowing in the heavens, which I had reopened when I ascended after my martyrdom. Prompted by the Holy Spirit, says the Gospel, oh, if men only knew what a perfect friend the Holy Spirit is, what guide, what teacher, if they only loved and invoked him, this love of the most holy trinity, this light of light, this fire of fire, this intelligence, this wisdom, how much more they would know of what is necessary to know. Look, Mary, listen, my children. Simeon waited all his long life before seeing the light and before knowing that God's promise was fulfilled. But he never doubted. He never said to himself, it is useless to persevere in hoping and praying. He just persevered. And he deserved to see what neither the priest nor the proud and dull members of the Sanhedrin saw. The Son of God, the Messiah, the Saviour in the flesh of a child who warmed him and smiled at him. He received the smile of God from the lips of a child his first reward for an honest and pious life. The other lesson, the words of Anna. She also, a prophetess, saw in me a newborn baby, the Messiah. And this is quite natural, considering her prophetic prerogative. But listen to what she says to my mother, moved by faith and charity and use her words as a light for your souls that quiver in these days of darkness and in this feast of light. Who gave a saviour will not lack the power to send his angel to console your tears. Consider that God gave himself to obliterate Satan's work in your souls, and will he not be able to now defeat the Satans that torture you? 
Will he not be able to wipe your tears, rooting these Satans and sending you once again the peace of his Christ? Why do you not ask him with faith, a real overbearing faith, a faith before which the rigour of God, indignant at your many faults, may turn into a smile, and he may grant you his forgiveness, which is relief, and his blessing, which will be a rainbow in this world, submerged in a deluge of blood, which you wanted yourselves. Remember, the father, after punishing men with the deluge, said to himself and to his patriarch, Never again will I curse the earth because of man, because his heart contrives evil from his infancy. Never again will I strike down every living thing as I have done. And he has been faithful to his word. He has not sent a deluge again. But how many times have you said to yourselves and to God, If we are spared this time, if you save us, we shall never make wars again, never again. And after, you have always made more terrifying ones. How many times, O oh false men, who have no respect either for God or for your own word, and yet God would help you once again, only if the large mass of the faithful would invoke him with faith and ardent love. Lay your worries at the feet of God, you who are too few to counterbalance the many who keep God's rigour alive, you who have remained devoted to him, notwithstanding the dreadful times which were increasing from day to day. He will send you his angel, as he sent the Saviour to the world. Do not be afraid. Be united to the cross. It has always defeated the snares of the demon, who, with the cruelties of men and the sadness of life, endeavours to drive to desperation, that is, to separation from God, the hearts he cannot conquer, in any other way. The Poem of the Man-God, Volume 1, Chapter 33, Lullaby of the Virgin, 28th of November, 1944. This morning I woke up in the gentlest way. I was still dozing when I heard the most pure voice I have ever heard sing a slow lullaby very sweetly. The song was so slow and archaic that it sounded a Christmas pastoral. I followed the melody and the voice, enjoying them more and more until I awoke completely. I then understood fully what was taking place, and I said, Hail Mary, full of grace, because it was Mother singing, and she raised her voice after saying to me, I greet you too, come and be happy. And I saw her in the house in Bethlehem, in her room, intent on lulling Jesus to sleep. In the room, there were Mary's loom and some needlework. I think Mary had stopped working to give the child suck and change his swaddling bands. I should say his clothes, because he was already a few months old. I would say six or eight months at most. Perhaps Mary was thinking of resuming her work after the child had fallen asleep. It was evening. The sun was setting and there were many small golden clouds in the clear sky. Some herds were going back to their folds, browsing on the last grass of a flowery meadow and bleating with their heads uplifted. The child was about to fall asleep. He seemed a little restless, as if he had teething trouble or some other minor pain of childhood. I wrote the song on a piece of paper as well as I could in the dim of light of a very early morning, and I will now copy it. Little golden clouds seem the herds of the Lord on the meadow full of flowers another herd is watching but if I had all the hearts that exist in the world, the lambkin dearest to me, you would always be. 
Sleep, 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 cry no more. Many glittering stars are twinkling in the sky. May your sweet gentle eyes shed no more tears. Your eyes of sapphire are the stars of my heart. Your tears make me cry. Oh, cry no more. Sleep, 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 cry no more. All oh, the sparkling angels that in heaven be Form a wreath around you, innocent child, and raptured by your face. But you're crying for your mummy, 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 to sing your lullaby. La 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 bye. Sleep, 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 cry no more. The sky will soon be red, and dawn will soon be back. And mommy had no rest to ensure you don't cry. Mama, when you awake, you will call me and I'll reply. A kiss of love and life. I'll give you with my breast. Sleep, 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 cry no more. You do need your mummy, or so if you dream of heaven. Come, do come under my veil. Ah, I will make you sleep. My breast is your pillow. Your cradle is my arms. Do not fear, my dear. I am here with you. Sleep, 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 cry no more. I'll always be with you. You're the life of my heart. He is sleeping like a flower. Resting on my breast, he is sleeping. Be quiet. Perhaps he sees his father, and the sight wipes off the tears of my sweet Jesus. He sleeps, 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 and he cries no more. It is impossible to describe the graceful charm of the sea. It is only a mother lulling her little one, but she is that mother 
and he is that little one. You can therefore imagine what gracefulness, what love, what purity, what paradise is in this little, great, sweet scene, the memory of which makes me so happy and is confirmed by the melody I continuously sing so that you may also hear it. But I do not have the most pure silvery voice of Mary, the virginal voice of the Virgin, and I will sound like a cracked organ. It does not matter. I will do my best. What a beautiful pastoral it will be to be sung round the crib at Christmas. Mary at first rocked the wooden cradle very slowly. Afterwards, when she saw that Jesus was not calming down, she took him in her arms, sitting near the open window with the cradle beside her, and swinging lightly to the rhythm of the song, she repeated the lullaby twice, until Jesus closed his little eyes. He turned his head round onto his mother's breast and fell asleep thus. His little face resting on the cosy warmth of his mother's breast, one hand also on her breast near his rosy cheeks, the other one relaxed on her lap. Mary's veil shaded her holy creature. Then Mary got up most carefully and laid Jesus in the cradle. She covered him with small linens. She spread a veil to protect him from flies and the fresh air. And she remained contemplating her sleeping treasure. She held one hand over her heart while the other was leaning on the cradle ready to rock it if necessary, and she smiled happily. Slightly bent, while darkness and silence were falling on the earth and were invading her little virginal room. What peace, what beauty, I am so happy. It is not a grand vision, and it will perhaps be considered quite useless in the mass of other visions, as it does not reveal anything special, I know. But it is a real grace to me, and I consider it such, because it makes my spirit placid, pure, loving, as if it were created again by mother's hands. I think that you will like it as well, in that sense. We are little children. Better thus, Jesus likes us. Let the others who are learned and complicated think what they like, and let them say that we are childish. We do not mind, do we? The Poem of the Man-God Volume 1, Chapter 34 The Adoration of the Wise Men 28th of February, 1944 My internal voice warns me. Call the contemplations you are about to receive and which I will tell you, the Gospels of Faith, because they will clarify for you and other people the power of faith and its fruits, and will confirm you in the faith in God. I see Bethlehem, small and white, gathered like a brood of chickens under the stars. It is night. There is nobody in the streets, as it is so late. I notice that the night light is increasing. It descends from a sky crowded with stars, which are so beautiful in the eastern sky. They are so bright and large and seemingly so near that it is possible to reach out and touch those flowers sparkling in the velvet of the vault of heaven. I raise my eyes to see the source of the increasing light, a star of such unusual size that the moon seems small in comparison, is moving forward in the sky of Bethlehem. And all the others seem to vanish and make room for it, as maidservants do when their queen passes by. Its brightness is such that it outshines them all. From the sphere, which looks like a huge pale sapphire lit up internally by a sun, a trail departs, in which blonde topazes, green emeralds, opalescent opals, blood-red flashes of rubies and gentle sparklings of amethysts mingle with the prevailing pale sapphire. All the stones on earth are in the trail that sweeps the sky with a fast and undulating movement as if it were alive. But the prevailing colour is the one emanating from the globe of the star, the heavenly pale sapphire hue which comes down and makes the houses, the streets, 
the ground of Bethlehem, the Saviour's cradle, look like blue silver. It is no longer the poor town, which by our standards is smaller than a country village. It is a fantastic town of a fairy tale, all in silver, and the water of the fountains and of the vessels is liquid diamond. And with a brighter radiation of light, the star stops over the little house on the narrowest side of the square. Neither the people dwelling in it nor the people in Bethlehem see it, because they are all asleep in their closed houses. But the star quickens its shining pulsations, and the trail vibrates and wavers faster and faster, drawing a kind of semicircle in the sky. And the sky lights up because of the net of stars drawn by the trail, a net full of precious jewels which shine and colour all the other stars with the most graceful hues, as if they were communicating their own joy to them. The little house is transfigured by the liquid fire of gems. The roof of the small terrace, the dark stone steps, the little door, are like a block of pure silver sprayed with diamond and pearl dust. No royal palace on earth has ever had, or will ever have, a staircase like this one, built to be used by angels and by a mother who is the mother of God. The little feet of the Immaculate Virgin can alight on that white splendour, the little feet which are destined to rest on the steps of God's throne. But the Virgin does not know. She is awake near her son's cradle and is praying. There are splendours in her soul which outdo the splendour with which the star is decorating material things. From the main road, a cavalcade is approaching. Harnessed horses are led by hand. Dromedaries and camels bear riders or are carrying loads. Their hooves make the sound of water that rustles and breaks against the stones of a torrent. When they reach the square, they all stop. The cavalcade, lit up by the star, is a fantasy of splendour. The harnesses of the most rich mounts, the clothes of the riders, their faces, their baggage, everything shines, and the light of the star increases the splendour of metals, leathers, silks, gems, coats. Eyes are radiant and mouths smiling because another splendour shines in their heart the splendour of a supernatural joy. While the servants move toward the caravansary with the animals, three members of the caravan dismount from their mounts, which a servant takes away at once, and they walk towards the house, and they prostrate themselves, touching the ground with their foreheads to kiss the soil. They are three personages of power, as is quite obvious from their very rich attire. One of them, of a very dark complexion, who dismounts from a camel, envelops himself in a siyama, Ethiopian garment, of pure bright silk, held tight to his waist by a precious girdle, from which a dagger or sword hangs with a jewel-studded hilt. Of the other two, who dismount from two splendid horses, one is wearing a beautiful striped robe, the dominant colour of which is yellow, fashioned like a long domino with hood and cordon, which looked like a piece of gold filigree, owing to the very rich golden embroidery. The third one is wearing a silk shirt, puffing out of long, large trousers, narrow at the ankles. He is enveloped in a very fine shawl which resembles a flowery garden, so bright are the flowers decorating it. On his head, he has a turban held by a little chain covered with diamond settings. After venerating the house where the Saviour is, they rise and go to the caravansary, square and hotel for caravans, where the servants have knocked and had the door opened. And the vision ends here. It starts again three hours later with the scene of the Magi adoring Jesus. It is daytime now. The sun is shining in the afternoon sky. One of the servants of the three magi crosses the square and climbs the steps of the little house. He goes in. He comes out and goes back to the hotel. 
The three magi come out, each followed by his own servant. They cross the square. The occasional passers-by turn round to look at the stately personages who are walking very slowly and solemnly. A full quarter of an hour has elapsed since the servant came out, and thus the inhabitants of the little house have had time to prepare to receive the guests. The magi are even more richly dressed than the night before. Their silks shine, the gems sparkle. A big bunch of precious feathers covered with even more precious chips quivers and shines on the head of the wise man wearing the turban. One of the servants is carrying an inlaid coffer, the metal reinforcements of which are all engraved gold. The second servant is holding a beautifully wrought chalice covered with a pure gold lid which is even more finely finished. The third servant has a kind of wide low amphora also in gold, the cover of which is shaped like a pyramid, at the top of which there is a diamond. The gifts appear to be heavy, because the servants are carrying them with some effort, particularly the one with the coffer. The magi climb the steps and go in. They enter a room that extends from the road to the back of the house. The little kitchen garden at the back can be seen through a window which is open to the sun. There are doors in the other two walls, and the owners, that is a man, a woman, and some boys and younger children, cast sidelong glances through them. Mary is sitting with the child in her lap, and Joseph is standing near her. But she also gets up and bows when she sees the Magi entering. She is all dressed in white. She is so beautiful in a plain white dress, which covers her from her neck down to her feet, from her shoulders to her slender wrists. She is so beautiful with her head crowned with her blonde plates, her face more rosy for the emotion, with her eyes smiling so sweetly while her mouth gives a greeting. May God be with you, that the three magi stop for a moment completely astonished. They then proceed and prostrate themselves at her feet, and they ask her to sit down. They do not sit down, although she asks them to do so. They remain kneeling relaxing on their heels. Behind them, also on their knees, are the three servants. They are immediately after the threshold. They have placed three gifts they were carrying in front of the Magi, and now they are waiting. The three wise men contemplate the child, who I think must be nine to twelve months old. He is so lively and strong. He is sitting on his mother's lap and smiles and prattles, with a shrill voice like a little bird. He is all dressed in white like his mother, with tiny sandals on his little feet. His dress is a very simple one, a small tunic, from which his restless feet protrude, and his plump little hands, which would like to get hold of everything, and above all, a most beautiful little face in which two dark blue eyes shine, and a pretty mouth with dimples at the sides, shows its first tiny teeth when it smiles. His pretty little curls are so bright and soft that they seem gold dust. The oldest of the Magi speaks on behalf of them all. He explains to Mary that one night in the previous December, they saw a new star of an unusual brightness appear in the sky. The maps of the sky had never shown or mentioned such a star. Its name was unknown because it had no name. Born out of the bosom of God, it had flourished to tell men a blessed truth, a secret of God. But men had paid no attention to it because their souls were steeped in mud. They did not lift their eyes to God, neither could they read the words that he writes with stars of fire in the vaults of heaven. May he be blessed for ever. They had seen it and had striven to understand its meaning. They were happy to give up the little sleep they usually granted themselves and, forgetting even their food, they devoted themselves entirely to studying the zodiac. And the conjunctions of the stars, the time, the season, the calculation of the hours past and of the astronomic combinations had told them the name and secret of the star, its name, Messiah. Its secret, the Messiah had come to our world. 
and they had set out to worship him, each of them unknown to the others, over mountains, across deserts, along valleys and rivers, travelling by night, they had come towards Palestine because the star was moving in that direction, each of them unknown to the others, for each of them from three different points on earth, it was going in that direction. And then they met beyond the Dead Sea. God's will had gathered them there, and they had then proceeded together, understanding one another, notwithstanding that each spoke his own language. By a miracle of the Eternal Father, they were able to understand and speak the language of each country. They had gone together to Jerusalem because the Messiah was to be the King of Jerusalem, the King of the Jews. But over the sky of that city, the star had concealed itself and they felt their hearts breaking with pain and had examined themselves to ascertain whether they had failed to deserve God. But when their consciences reassured them, they had applied to King Herod and had asked him in which royal palace the King of the Jews was to be born because they had come to adore him. And the king had gathered the chief priests and the scribes and had asked them where the Messiah might be born. And they replied, in Bethlehem in Judah. And they had come toward Bethlehem, and as soon as they left the holy city, the star had reappeared to them. And the night before their arrival in Bethlehem, its brightness had increased, the whole sky was ablaze. Then the star had stopped over this house, engulfing all the light of the other stars in its ray. And they had understood that the divine newborn baby was there. And now they were worshipping him, offering their gifts, and above all, their hearts, which never ceased thanking God for the grace granted to them. Neither would they ever stop loving his son, whose holy human body they had now seen. Later they intended to go back to King Herod, because he also wanted to adore him. In the meantime, here is the gold which befits a king to possess. Here is the incense which befits a god. And here, mother, here is the myrrh, because your child is a man as well as God, and he will experience the bitterness of the flesh and of human life, as well as the inevitable law of death. Our souls full as they are of love, would prefer not to utter these words, and we would rather think that his flesh is also eternal as his spirit. But, woman, if our writings and above all our souls are right, he is your son, the Saviour, the Christ of God, and consequently to save the world, he will have to take upon himself the evil of the world, of which one of the punishments is death. This myrrh is for that hour. That his holy flesh may not be subject to the rot of putrefaction, but may preserve its integrity until his resurrection. And on that account of his gift, may he remember us and save his servants by allowing them to enter his kingdom. In the meantime, that we may be sanctified. Will you, mother, trust your little one to our love, that his heavenly blessing may descend upon us while we kiss his feet? Mary, who has overcome the fright caused by the words of the wise man, and has hidden with a smile the sadness of the doleful illusion, offers the child. She lays him in the arms of the oldest one who kisses him and receives his caresses, and he then hands him over to the other two. Jesus smiles and plays with the little chains and fringes of the robes of the three magi, and he looks curiously at the open coffer, full of a yellow sparkling substance, and he smiles at the rainbow produced by the sun shining on the brilliant top of the lid of the myrrh. They then hand back the child to Mary, and they stand up. Mary also gets up. They bow to one another, after the youngest has given an order to the servant, who goes out. The three men go on speaking for a little while. They cannot make up their minds to depart from the house. T 
tears shine in their eyes. At last, they move towards the door, accompanied by Mary and Joseph. The child wanted to get down and give his hand to the oldest of the three. And he walked stuff, held by his hands, by Mary and the wise man, both of whom bend down to steady him. Jesus walks with a hesitant step like all children, and he laughs, kicking his little feet on the strip of the floor lit up by the sun. When they reach the threshold, it must not be forgotten that the room is as long as the house. The Magi take leave, kneeling down once again, kissing Jesus' feet. Mary, bending down over the child, takes his hand and guides it in a blessing gesture over the head of each wise man. It is already a sign of the cross, traced by Jesus' little fingers, guided by Mary. The three men go down the steps. The caravan is already there waiting for them. The horse's studs shine in the setting sun. People have gathered in the little square, watching the unusual sight. Jesus laughs, clapping his hands. His mother has lifted him up on the wide parapet of the landing and is holding him against her breast with her arm so that he may not fall. Joseph has gone down with the Magi and is holding the stir up to each of them while they mount their horses and the camel. Servants and masters are now all on horseback. The starting command is given. The three men bow down as low as the neck of their mounts in a final gesture of homage. Joseph bows down. Also Mary bows. And then she guides Jesus' hand again in a gesture of goodbye and blessing. Jesus says, and now what shall I tell you, O souls who feel your faith is dying? Those wise men from the East had nothing to assure them of the truth, nothing supernatural. All they had was an astronomic calculation and their own considerations made perfect by a strictly honest life. And yet they had faith, faith in everything, in science, in their own conscience, in God's goodness. Science made them believe in the sign of the new star, which could only be the one expected by mankind for centuries, the Messiah. Because of their consciences, they had faith in the voices of their consciences, which heard heavenly voices saying to them, that is the star announcing the advent of the Messiah. Because of God's goodness, they believed that God would not deceive them, and since their intention was honest, he would help them in every way to reach their aim. And they were successful. Among so many people fond of studying signs, they were the only ones who understood that sign, because their souls were anxious to know the words of God for an honest purpose the main care of which was to praise and honour God immediately. They did not seek any personal advantage. On the contrary, they have to face hardships and meet expenses, but they do not ask for any human reward. They only ask God to remember them and save them for eternal life. As they have no desire for any future human rewards, so they have no human worry when they decide on their journey you would have had hundreds of problems. How will I be able to make such a long journey in countries and among people speaking different languages? Will they believe me or will they put me in prison as a spy? What help will they give me to cross the deserts, rivers and mountains and the heat and the winds of the highlands and the malarial fever along stagnant marshes and the floods and heavy rains and the different food and the different language and, and, and. That is how you reason. But they do not reason like that. With sincere holy daring, they say, you, O oh God, can read our hearts and you see the purpose we are aiming at. We trust to your hands. Grant us the superhuman joy of adoring your second person who has become flesh 
to save the world. That is all. And they set out from the far away Indies. Jesus then tells me that when he says the Indies, he means meridional Asia where Turkey, Afghanistan and Persia are located in our geography. From the Mongolian chains of mountains, which are the dominions of eagles and vultures, where God speaks with the roars of winds and torrents, and writes words of mystery on the immense pages of glaciers. From the land where the Nile rises and then flows with its green-blue waters, to the azure heart of the Mediterranean, neither mountains nor woods nor sands, dry oceans, more dangerous than the seas, can stop them from proceeding. And the star shines upon them at night, preventing them from sleeping. When one seeks God, natural habits must yield to superhuman considerations and necessities. The star guides them from the north, the east, and the south, and by a miracle of God, it proceeds for the three of them towards one point. And by another miracle of God, after many miles, it gathers them at the point, and by a farther miracle, it anticipates the Pentecost wisdom, bestowing on them the gift of understanding and making themselves understood, as it happens in paradise, where only one language is spoken, God's. They are dismayed only for a moment when the star disappears, and since they are humble, because they are really great, they do not think it is due to the wickedness of other people, as the corrupted people of Jerusalem did not deserve to see the star of God. But they think they had failed to deserve God themselves, and they examine themselves with trepidation and contrition, ready to beg forgiveness. But their consciences reassure them. Their souls were accustomed to meditation, and each of them had a most sensitive conscience, refined by constant attention and by sharp introspection, which made of the interior a mirror on which even the slightest faults of daily actions are reflected. Their conscience had become their teacher, a voice that warns and cries, not at the least error, but at the least inclination towards errors, at everything human, at the satisfaction of one's ego. Consequently, when they place themselves before that teacher and that severe clean mirror, they know that it will not lie. It reassures them and gives them heart. Oh, how sweet it is to feel that there is nothing against God in us. To feel that he is kindly looking at the soul of his faithful son and blesses him. Faith, trust, hope, strength and patience are increased by such a feeling. The storm is raging just now, but it will pass because God loves me and he knows that I love him and he will not fail to help me again. That is how those speak who enjoy the peace that comes from an upright conscience, that is the queen of every action of theirs. I said that they were humble because they were all really great. What happens instead in your lives? There a man is never humble, not because he is great, but because he is more domineering and makes himself mighty by means of his arrogance and because of your silly idolatry. There are some wretched men who simply because they are the butlers of some overbearing fellow, or ushers in some office, or officials in some small village, that is servants of those who employed them, put on the airs of demigods, and they arouse pity. The three wise men were really great. Firstly, because of their supernatural virtues, Secondly, because of their science. Last, because of their wealth. But they feel that they are nothing, dust on the dust of the earth, in comparison with the Most High God, who with a smile creates the worlds and scatters them like grains of corn to satisfy the eyes of the angels with the jewels of the stars. They feel they are a mere nothing as compared to the Most High God, who created the planet on which they live, and he made it most varied. 
an infinite sculptor of boundless works. With a touch of his thumb, he placed a ring of hills here, the bone structure of mountain ridges and peaks there, like vertebrae of the earth, of this enormous body, the veins of which are the rivers, its basins the lakes, its hearts the oceans, its dresses the forests, its veils the clouds, its decorations the crystal glaciers, its gems the turquoises and emeralds, the opals and the barrels of all the waters that sing, with the woods and the winds, the great chorus of praise to their Lord. But they feel they are nothing with regard to their wisdom as compared to the Most High God, from whom their wisdom comes, and who gave them more powerful eyes than those two pupils by means of which they see things. The eyes of their souls, which know how to read in things the word not written by human hands, but engraved by God's thoughts. And they feel they are nothing with regard to their wealth, an atom as compared to the wealth of the owner of the universe, who scatters metals and gems in the stars and planets and grants supernatural, unexhausted riches to the hearts of those who love him. And when they arrive before the poor house, in the poorest town in Judah, they do not shake their heads, saying, impossible. But they bend their backs, their knees, and above all their hearts and they adore. There, behind that poor wall, there is God, the God they have always invoked, but never had the least hope of seeing. And they invoke him for the welfare of all mankind and their eternal welfare. Oh, that was their only wish, to see him, know him, possess him in the life where there are no more dawns and sunsets. He is there, behind that poor wall. Will his heart of a child, which is still the heart of a god, perceive those three hearts, which prostrated in the dust of the road and are crying, Holy, 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 blessed the Lord our God. Glory to him in the highest heaven and peace to his servants. Glory, glory, glory and blessings. They are wondering with loving tremor, and during the whole night and the following morning they prepare with the most ardent prayer their souls for the communion with the child God. They do not go to that altar which is the virginal lap holding the divine host with their souls full of human worries as you do. They forget to eat and to sleep, and if they wear the most beautiful robes, it is not for human ostentation, but to honour the King of Kings. In royal palaces, the dignitaries wear the most beautiful clothes. And should the Magi not go to that King in their best garments? Which great opportunity is there for them? Oh, in their faraway countries, many a time they had to adorn themselves for men like themselves, to welcome and honour them. It is only fair, therefore, that they should prostrate purples and jewels, silks and precious feathers at the feet of the Supreme King. It is fair to put at his sweet little feet the fibres of the earth, the gems of the earth, the feathers of the earth, the metals of the earth. They are all his work. So that all these things of the earth may adore their Creator and they would be happy if the little creature should order them to lie down on the ground and become a living carpet for his little baby steps. And if he trampled on them, since he left the stars to come down to them, who are but dust. They were humble, generous and obedient to the voices from above. They tell them to take gifts to the newborn king, and they take gifts. They do not say, he is rich and does not need them, he is God and will not die. They obey. And they are the first to help the Saviour in his poverty. How useful that gold will be for him who is about to be a fugitive. How meaningful that myrrh is for him who will soon be killed. 
how pious that incense is for him who will have to smell the stench of human lewdness raging around his infinite purity. They were humble, generous, obedient, and respectful to one another. Virtues always generate other virtues. From the virtues directed to God derive the virtues regarding our neighbors. Respect, which is charity. The oldest is entrusted with the task of speaking on behalf of them all. He is the first to receive the Savior's kiss and to hold him by his little hand. The others will be able to see him again. He will not, because he is old and the day for his return to God is not far away. He will see Christ after his heart-rending death and will follow him, together with the other blessed souls, in his return to heaven. But he will never see him again in this world. May therefore the warmth of his little hand, entrusted to his wrinkled one, be a viaticum for him. There is no envy in the others. On the contrary, their veneration for the old wise man increases. He certainly deserved more than they did, and for a longer period of time. The God-infant knows. The word of the Father does not speak yet, but every action of his is a word. And may his innocent word be blessed, because it designated him as his favourite. But my dear children, there are two more lessons in this vision. The behaviour of Joseph who knows how to keep his place. He is present as the guardian of purity and holiness, but not as the usurper of their rights. It is Mary with Jesus who receives the homage and the words. Joseph rejoices because of her and does not grieve because he is a secondary figure. Joseph is a just man. He is the just man. And he is always just. Also at the present moment, the fumes of the feast do not go to his head. He remains humble and just. He is happy for the gifts, not for himself, but because he thinks that with them he will be able to make his spouses and the sweet child's lives more comfortable. There is no greed in Joseph. He is a workman and will continue to work. But he is anxious that they, his two loves, should be more comfortable. Neither he nor the Magi know that those gifts serve for a flight and a life in exile when riches vanish like clouds scattered by winds, as well as for their return to their country, where they have lost everything, customers and household furnishings, and where only the walls of their house have been saved, which were protected by God, because there he was united to the Virgin and became flesh. Joseph is humble. In fact, although he is the guardian of God, and of the mother of God and spouse of the Most High. He holds the stirrups of these vassals of God. He is a poor carpenter, because sustained human precious have deprived David's heirs of their royal wealth. But he is always the offspring of a king, and has the manners of a king. Also of him, it must be said, he was humble, because he was really great. A last, kind, significant lesson. It is Mary who takes the hand of Jesus, who does not yet know how to bless, and she guides it in the holy gesture. It is always Mary who takes Jesus' hand and guides it, even now. Now Jesus knows how to bless, but sometimes his pierced hand falls down tired and disheartened, because he knows that it is useless to bless. You destroy my blessing. It falls into indignant because you curse me. It is Mary, then, who removes the disdain from my hand with her kisses. Oh, the kisses of my mother, who can resist that kiss? And then, with her slender but lovingly irresistible fingers, she takes my wrist 
and forces me to bless. I cannot reject my mother, but you must go to her and make her your advocate. She is my queen before being yours, and her love for you makes such allowances that no one can possibly imagine or understand. And even without any word, but only with her tears and the memory of my cross, a sign of which she makes me trace in the air. She pleads your cause and exhorts me. You are the savior, therefore save. That is, my dear children, the gospel of faith. In the vision of the scene of the Magi, meditate on it and imitate it for your own The Poem of the Man-God, Volume 1, Chapter 35, The Flight into Egypt, 9th of June, 1944. My spirit sees the following scene. It is night. Joseph is sleeping in his little bed in his very small room. The peaceful sleep of a man after a hard day's honest and diligent work. I can see him in the dark room because a thin ray of moonlight filters in through the window shutters left ajar, either because Joseph is too warm in the little room, or because he wants to be woken by the early rays of light at daybreak and get up at once. He is lying on one side and is smiling at some vision he sees in his dream. But his smile turns into an expression of anxiety. He is now sighing deeply as if he had a nightmare, and he awakes with a start. He sits up on his bed, rubs his eyes and looks around. He looks at the little window where the feeble light comes in. It is the dead of night, but he grasps his robe which is lying at the bottom of the bed and still sitting on the bed, he pulls it on over the white short-sleeved tunic which he is wearing next to his skin. He pulls the blanket away, puts his feet on the floor and looks for his sandals. He puts them on and ties them. He stands up and goes toward the door facing his bed, not the one at the side of his bed leading to the big room where the magi were received. He knocks very gently, a very soft knocking with the tips of his fingers. He must have heard a voice asking him to enter because he opens the door carefully and sets it ajar without making any noise. Before going to the door, he has lit a small one-flamed oil lamp, lights his way with it. He goes in. The room is a little larger than his own, and there is a low bed in it, near a cradle, with a night lamp in a corner, the flickering flame of which seems a little star with a soft golden light that allows one to see without disturbing my any sleeper. But Mary is not sleeping. She is kneeling near the cradle in her light dress and is praying, watching Jesus who is sleeping peacefully. Jesus is the same age as I saw him in the vision of the Magi. A child about one year old, beautiful, rosy and fair-headed. He is sleeping with his curly head sunk in the pillow and a clenched fist under his chin. Are you not sleeping? Joseph asks her in a low, surprised voice. Why not? Is Jesus not well? Oh no, he's all right. I am praying. Later I will sleep. Why have you come, Joseph? Mary speaks, kneeling on the same spot. Joseph speaks in a very low voice, lest he should awaken the child. But it is an excited voice. We must go away from here at once. It must be at once. Prepare the coffer and the sack with everything you can put in them. I'll prepare the rest. I'll take as much as I can. We will flee at dawn. I would go even sooner, but I must speak to the landlady. But why this flight? I will tell you later. It's because of Jesus. An angel said to me, Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Don't waste any time. I'm going to prepare what I can. There is no need to tell Mary not to waste time. As soon as she heard Joseph mention an angel, Jesus and flight, she understood that her creature was in danger, and she jumped to her feet. 
her face whiter than wax, holding one hand against her heart, completely distressed. And she began to move about, quick and agile, laying the clothes in the coffer and in a large sack, which she places on her bed still untouched. Although she is disheartened, she does not lose her head. She acts quickly but orderly. Now and again, when passing near the cradle, she looks at the child who is sleeping calmly. Do you need help? Joseph asks now and again, peeping into the room through the door jar. No, thank you, replies Mary every time. Only when her sack is full, and it is obviously very heavy, she calls Joseph to help her to close it and take it off the bed. But Joseph does not want to help, he prefers to do it by himself, and he takes the long sack into his little room. Shall I also take the woolen blankets? asks Mary. Take as much as you can, we will lose the rest. Do take as much as you can, things will be useful, because, because we will have to stay away for a long time, Mary. Joseph is very sad in saying so, and one can easily imagine how Mary feels. She folds her blankets in Joseph's, sighing deeply. Joseph ties the blankets with a rope, and while doing so, he says, We will leave the quilts and the mats. Even if I take three donkeys, I cannot overload them. We will have a long and uncomfortable journey, partly in the mountains and in the desert. Cover Jesus well, the nights will be cold, both up in the mountains and in the desert. I am taking the gifts of the Magi, because they will be very useful down there. I am going to spend all the money I have to buy two donkeys. We cannot send them back, so I will have to buy them. I will go now, without awaiting dawn. I know where to find them. You finish preparing everything. And he goes out. Mary gathers a few more things, then, after looking at Jesus, she goes out and comes back with some little dresses which appear to be still damp. Perhaps they were washed the day before. She folds them, wraps them up in a cloth, and adds them to the other things. There is nothing else. She looks round and in a corner she sees one of Jesus' toys, a little sheep carved in wood. She picks it up, sobbing, and kisses it. On the wood there are traces of Jesus' little teeth, and the ears of the little sheep are all nibbled. Mary caresses the thing without any value, a plain piece of light wood which, however, is of great value to her, because it tells her of Joseph's love for Jesus and speaks to her of her child. She adds it to the other things placed on the closed coffer. Now there is really nothing else except Jesus in the little cradle. Mary thinks she ought also to prepare the child. She goes to the cradle and shakes it a little to wake up the baby. But he whimpers a little, turns round and continues to sleep. Mary pats his curls gently. Jesus opens his little mouth, yawning. Mary bends down and kisses his cheek. Jesus wakes up completely. He opens his eyes sees his mother and smiles and stretches his little hands towards her breast. Yes, love of your mummy, yes, your milk, before the usual time. But you are always ready to suck your mummy's breast, my little holy lamb. Jesus laughs and plays, kicking his little feet out of the blanket, moving his arms happily in a typical childish style, so beautiful to see. He pushes his feet against his mummy's stomach. He arches his back, leaning his fair head on her breast, and then throws himself back and laughs, holding with his hands the laces that tie Mary's dress to her neck, endeavouring to open it. He looks most beautiful in his little linen shirt, plump and as rosy as a flower. Mary bends down, and in that position, looking through the cradle, as if for protection, she smiles and cries at the same time, while the child prattles, uttering words which are not the words of all little children. Among them, the word mummy is repeated very clearly. He looks at her, 
surprised to see her crying. He stretches one little hand towards the shiny traces of her tears, and it gets wet while patting her face. And, very gracefully, he leans once again on his mother's breast. He clings to it and pats it with his hands. Mary kisses his hair, takes him up in her arms, sits down and dresses him. His little woolen dress has now been put on him, and his sandals have been tied on his feet. She nurses him, and Jesus avidly sucks his mother's good milk. And when he feels that only a little is coming from her right breast, he looks for the left one, laughing while doing so and looking up at his mother. Then he falls asleep again on her breast, his rosy, round little cheek resting against her white, round breast. Mary rises very slowly and lays him on the quilt on her bed. She covers him with her mantle. She goes back to the cradle and folds its little blankets. She wonders whether she ought to take also the little mattress. It is so small. It can be taken, she puts it, together with the pillow. Near the other things already on the coffer. And she cries over the empty cradle. Poor mother, persecuted in her little creature. Joseph comes back. Are you ready? Is Jesus ready? Have you taken his blankets and his little bed? We can't take his cradle, but he must have at least his little mattress. Poor baby, whose death are they seeking? Joseph, shouts Mary, while she grasps his arm. Yes, Mary, his death. Herod wants him dead, because he is afraid of him. That filthy beast, because of his human kingdom, he is afraid of this innocent child. I do not know what he will do when he realises that he has escaped. But we will be far away by that time. I don't know he will revenge himself by seeking him as far as Galilee. It would be very difficult for him to find out that we are Galileans, least of all that we are from Nazareth, and who we are precisely, unless Satan helps him to thank him for being his faithful servant. But if that should happen... God will help us just the same. Don't cry, Mary. To see you crying is a greater pain for me than having to go into exile. Forgive me, Joseph. I am not crying for myself or for the few things I am losing. I am crying for you. You already have had to sacrifice yourself so much. And now, once again, you will have no customers, no home. How much I am costing you, Joseph? How much? No, Mary, you do not cost me. You comfort me always. Don't worry about the future. We have the gifts of the Magi. They will serve for the first days. Later I will find some work. A good, clever workman will always make his way. You have seen what happened here. I haven't got enough time for all the work I have. I know. But who will relieve your homesickness for your native land? And what about you? Who will relieve your longing for your home, which is so dear to you? Jesus, having him, I have what I had there. And I, having Jesus, have my native land, in which I had hope up to some months ago. I have my God. You can see that I lose nothing of what is dear to me of of all things. The only important thing is to save Jesus, and then we have everything. Even if we should never see this sky again, or this country, or the even dearer country of Galilee, we shall always have everything, because we shall have him. Come, Mary, it is dawning. It is time to say goodbye to our hostess and load our things. Everything will be all right. Mary gets up obediently. She puts on her mantle while Joseph makes up a last parcel and goes out with it. Mary lifts the child gently, envelops him in a shawl and clasps him to her heart. She looks at the wall that had given her hospitality for some months and she touches them caressingly with one hand. Happy house that deserved to be loved and blessed by Mary. She goes out. She goes through Joseph's little room into the big room. The landlady, in tears, 
kisses her goodbye, and lifting the edge of the shawl, she kisses the forehead of the child who is sleeping calmly. They go down the outside steps. The first light of dawn enables them to see faintly. In the dim light, three little donkeys can be seen. The strongest is loaded with the goods and chattels. The other two are saddled. Joseph is busy fastening the coffer and bundles on the pack saddle of the first one. I can see his carpenter's tools tied in a bundle on top of the sack. After more tears and goodbyes, Mary mounts the little donkey while the landlady is holding Jesus in her arms and kissing him once again. She then hands him back to Mary. Also, Joseph mounts after tying his donkey to the one loaded with the goods in order to be free to hold the reins of Mary's donkey. The flight begins while Bethlehem, still dreaming of the phantasmagorical scene of the Magi, is sleeping peacefully, unaware of what is impending over it. And the vision ends thus. Jesus says, And also this series of visions ends thus. With the permission of exacting doctors, we have been showing you the scenes which preceded, accompanied and followed my coming. And we did so, not for their own sakes, as they are well known, although they have been distorted by elements superimposed throughout centuries, always as a consequence of the mentality of men, who in order to give greater praise to God, and are therefore forgiven, make unreal what would be so lovely to leave real. Such way of seeing things in their reality does not diminish my humanity or Mary's, neither does it offend my divinity or the majesty of the Father or the love of the Most Holy Trinity. On the contrary, the merits of my mother and my perfect humility shine brightly, and so does the only potent kindness of the eternal law. But we have shown you these scenes in order to be able to apply to you and to other people the supernatural meaning in deriving from them and give it to you as a rule of life. The Decalogue is the law, and my gospel is the doctrine that makes the law clearer for you and more loving to follow. The law and my doctrine would be sufficient to make saints of men. But you are so hampered by your humanity, it really overwhelms your souls too much, that you cannot follow my ways and you fall. Or you stop disheartened. You go on saying to yourselves and to those who would like to assist you, quoting the examples of the gospel for you. But Jesus, but Mary, but Joseph, and so on for all the saints, were not like us. They were strong. They were immediately comforted in their sorrow. Also, in the little sorrow which they experienced, they did not feel passions. They were already beings out of this world. That little sorrow, they did not feel passions. Sorrow has been our faithful friend, and it had all the most varied forms and names. Passions. Do not use a word wrongly by calling passions the vices which mislead you. Be sincere and call them vices, and capital ones in addition. It is not true that we did not know them. We had eyes to see and ears to hear, and Satan caused those vices to dance in front of us and around us, showing them to us with their heap of filth in action, or tempting us with his insinuations. But since we firmly wanted to please God, his filth and insinuations, instead of achieving the purpose intended by Satan, obtained the very opposite. And the more he worked, the more we took shelter in the light of God, disgusted as we were with the muddy darkness which he showed to the eyes of our bodies and of our souls. But we did not ignore in our hearts passions in their philosophical setting. We loved our country, and in our country we loved our little Nazareth above every other town in Palestine. 
We were fond of our house, of our relatives and friends. Why should we not? We did not become slaves to our feelings, because nothing is to be our master except God. But our feelings were our good companions. My mother uttered a cry of joy when, after about four years, she went back to Nazareth and entered her house and kissed the walls where her yes had opened her bosom to receive the Son of God. Joseph joyfully greeted his relatives and his little nephews, who had grown in numbers and in years, and he rejoiced when he saw that his fellow citizens remembered him and they sought him because of his ability. I myself appreciated friendship, and because of Judas's betrayal, I suffered as for a moral crucifixion. And why not? Neither my mother nor Joseph ever placed more love for their home or their relatives before the will of God, and I never spared a word, if it was to be said, capable of drawing upon me the hatred of the Jews and the animosity of Judas. I knew. And I could have brought it about that some money would be sufficient to subject him to me, not to me a redeemer, to me a rich man. I had multiplied the loaves of bread, and if I wanted, I could multiply also money. But I did not come to obtain human satisfactions to anybody, least of all to the ones I had called. I had preached a sacrifice. Detachment, a pure life, humble positions. What kind of a master would I have been, and what just man, if I had given money to one of them for his mental and physical satisfaction, only because that was the means to keep him? Those who make themselves small are great in my kingdom. Those who wish to be great in the eyes of the world. Are not suitable to reign in my kingdom. They are straw for the beds of the demons, because the greatness of the world is the antithesis of the law of God. The world calls great those who, by means which almost always are illicit, know how to get the best positions, and to do so, they use their neighbor as a stool on which they then climb, crushing him. The world calls great those who know how to kill in order to reign, and they kill materially or morally, and they usurp positions and countries and fatten themselves, bleeding both individuals and communities. The world often calls great criminals. No, greatness is not to be found in criminality; it is in goodness, in honesty, in love, in justice. You can see which poisonous fruit your great ones offer you, fruit which they have picked in the wicked, devilish garden inside them. I only wish to speak about the last vision and omit the rest, because in any case it is useless, as the world does not want to hear the truth concerning it. The last vision clarifies a detail quoted twice in the Gospel by Matthew. A sentence which is repeated twice: "Get up, take the child and his mother with you, and escape into Egypt." Get up, take the child and his mother with you, and go back to the land of Israel. And you saw that Mary was by herself in her room with the child. Mary's virginity after her delivery and Joseph's chastity. Have been strongly denied by those who, being putrid mud themselves, are not prepared to admit that one like them can be as pure and clear as light. They are wretched people, whose souls are so corrupted and their minds so prostituted to the flesh that they are incapable of thinking that one like them can respect a woman, seeing in her not her flesh, but her soul. Neither can they elevate themselves to live in a supernatural atmosphere, craving not for what is flesh, but only for what is God. Well, I wish to tell those deniers of the most beautiful things, those worms incapable of becoming butterflies, those reptiles 
covered with the slaver of their own lewdness, incapable of understanding the beauty of a lily. I wish to tell them that Mary was and remained a virgin, and that only her soul was married to Joseph, exactly as her spirit was united only to the Spirit of God, by whose deed she conceived her only son, I, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of the Father and of Mary. This is not a tradition embellished afterwards, out of loving respect for the Blessed Virgin who was my mother. It is the truth and has been known since early times. Matthew was not born after centuries, he was a contemporary of Mary. Matthew was not a poor, ignorant man brought up in a forest and likely to believe any idle story. He was a clerk in the taxation office, as you would say nowadays. He was an exciseman, as we said then. He could see, hear, understand, and tell the truth from the false. Matthew did not hear things reported by third parties. He heard them directly from Mary's lips to whom he applied for information, prompted by his love for his master and for the truth. I do not believe that those repudiators of Mary's inviolability will dare think that she may have lied. My own relatives could have given her the lie, had there been other children. James, Judas, Simon and Joseph were disciples together with Matthew. Therefore, Matthew could have easily compared their versions, had there been more than one account. But Matthew does not say, get up and take your wife. He says, take his mother. Before, he says, a virgin betrothed to Joseph. Joseph, her spouse. Neither those repudiators of purity should tell me that it was a way of speaking particular to the Jews, as if to say wife was a disgrace. No, deniers of purity. At the very beginning of the Bible we read, and he will join himself to his wife. She is called companion up to the moment of the sensual consummation of the marriage, and afterwards she is called wife in various circumstances and in different chapters. And these are the expressions referred to the wives of the sons of Adam. And so Sarah is called the wife of Abraham. Sarah, your wife. And take your wife and your two daughters is said of Lot. And in the book of Ruth it is written, the Moabites, the wife of Mahalan. And in the first book of the kings it is said, Elkanah had two wives. And further on, Elkanah then had intercourse with his wife, Hannah. And again, Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife. And again in the book of the Kings it is said, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, became the wife of David and bore him a son. And what do you read in the blue book of Tobias? What the church signs to you at your wedding to advise you to be holy in your marriage? You read, Now then, Tobias arrived with his wife and his son. And again, Tobias succeeded in escaping with his son and with his wife. And in the Gospels, that is in times contemporary with Christ, when therefore they wrote in a modern style of language, as compared to the ancient kind, and therefore no error of transcription could be suspected, it said, and just by Matthew in chapter 22, and the first, after marrying his wife, died, and left his wife to his brother. And Mark, at chapter 10, the man who divorces his wife. And Luke called Elizabeth the wife of Zacharias four, four times running. And in the eighth chapter of his gospel, he says, Johanna, the wife of Cusa. As you can see, this name was not a word banished by those who walked in the ways of the Lord. It was not an impure word, but worthy of being uttered and least of all written. When there was a mention of God and of his wonderful work, and the angel saying, the child and his mother, 
proves to you that Mary was his real mother. But she was not a wife of Joseph. She remained forever a virgin betrothed to Joseph. And this is the last teaching of the vision, and it is a halo which shines on the heads of Mary and Joseph, the inviolate virgin, the just and chaste man, the two lilies amongst whom I grew up, receiving only the perfume of purity. I could speak to you, little John, about Mary's grief at being torn away from her house and her fatherland, but there is no need for words. You understand, and you die of grief. Give me your sorrow. That is all I want. It is greater than anything else you could give me. It is Friday today, Mary. Think of my grief and of my mother's on Golgotha in order to be able to bear your cross. Our peace and love remain with you.